What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Reel Me In, colon, a movie podcast where you didn't really ask for it, but hey, we're going to give it to you anyways. This is a podcast where we talk about anything, everything, and, well, anything about movies. I'm one of your co-hosts, Chase Lee, and hey, guys, listen, if you're searching on the web, the interwebs, the www.coms, orgs, or .nets, and you were looking for a movie podcast where you can just kind of come in there and just join the community, join the fun, and talk about your favorite thing in life, which is movies and so you stumbled across this one reel me in you're like well, what's this reel me in business I, I don't know what's going on i'm a little scared right now well i'm gonna tell you right now don't be scared come join in uh our, our party our little community and you know enjoy talking about movies with us uh, that is what we like to do here and we hope that you stay and enjoy the ride now if you are a new listener welcome once again if you're a returning listener welcome back what we typically do on the show is that we'll go over some movie news and trailers that drop throughout the week and we will commentate on them for you guys and then we will have a review or reviews of a movie uh or movies that come out on said weekend of recording and the box office results to accompany that this is episode 240 we're almost to 250 that's crazy um and so the main review this week is Mission Impossible Expensive Mustache. Uh, no, it is uh, Mission Impossible uh, Fallout, and that is our main topic of discussion, which is which is great because I'm excited. Um, I-, I know Joel is a huge fan of the franchise, and he was not a part of the show back when Rogue Nation came out. So this will be our first Mission Impossible to talk about. And, of course, Joel will have a surprise review for you guys uh before i throw it over to the co-host if you guys could just spread this uh podcast around you know like favorite subscribe do what you gotta do uh to spread this around and let people know that this is the movie podcast to listen to uh and speaking of the joseph over there joel how are we doing this week hello hello i'm doing pretty well um it's interesting that you that you mentioned uh rogue nation because um (laughs) it came out only days before the first movie we saw together um uh, which was the end of the tour. Yep. Um, we, we saw that, that screening, it was like a Monday night, I think. Right. And mm-hmm. we, um, and it had come out the previous Friday. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of funny that, that it's kind of come full circle in a way that right before we met officially. Now, of course we had been connected on Facebook for several months, but we, we didn't officially meet face to face until then. And, uh, so it's just kind of funny that, that um, the very weekend that you recorded, or just after the very weekend that you recorded the episode uh, about Mission Impossible, is when uh, is when we met. So anyway, um, yeah, I'm doing pretty good this week. I've been kind of uneventful, doing a lot of stuff at home. Um, it's kind of boring. So uh, other than that, you know, just saw some movies, got started on a big project thing that I won't talk about right now. But um, just last night, I watched. I rewatched a couple movies from 2010, if that offers anybody a hint, because uh, we're reaching the end of the decade, and you know, got to start thinking about things. Um, so I watched a couple movies last night: Inception, um, which is still great; Catfish, which is still great. Um, both were instrumental in my top ten of the year. Again, I'm just offering hints here, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm starting the whole. I, I guess I'll just give it away. I'm starting the whole process of reappraising a lot of the movies that I love from this decade to try to figure out a, a direction for, you know, what's got to happen at the end of the decade uh, when we talk about the movies that we love the most. Um, and so I started that just last night, just after a realization, I have to do this because otherwise I'm going to be lost. And a year and a half away, that's not a whole lot of time. Uh, and so I, I very, very early stages of this, but I'm going to be posting like on Facebook, maybe on my, uh, maybe on my website too. We'll see. Um, you know, certainly on Facebook, uh, publicly, I'll be posting kind of reapp- reappraisals of, of the various years to figure out, you know, what, what are my favorite movies? Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's, it's just, it's just a fun process for sure. Uh, I, I, I not like, for instance, uh, I just told you this before we, uh, recorded, but my top 10 of 2013, well, really my top 20, because that was an amazing year. And I, had a bunch of movies that I loved, um, but specifically my top ten. I don't think I've watched maybe uh, maybe one of them like three years ago, but the other ones I haven't seen since they came out. So that's going to be interesting five years later to see those. Um, so it's just a, it's just a fun process. But that's pretty much the only eventful thing that, <laughs> that happened this week for me. It was it was kind of a dull week, honestly. I have a big week coming up, but uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, kind of uneventful this week. 
Well, th- that's that's uh, interesting. My week was uh, filled with a lot of stuff, and I'm going to know the fate of my life tomorrow. But, you know, uh, <laughs> before we get into that, um, it, the Mission Impossible Rogue Nation episode, besides the spread of our Florida Project and Snowman combo, the Rogue Nation and Vacation combo was probably <laughs> the biggest grade spread I had had since we did the Snowman and Florida Project. So... I did. I did not even. I mean, I I actually hadn't seen the original Vacation, so of course I wasn't going to see the new one without seeing the old one. And I didn't find anything interesting looking about the new one enough to get a, a, acquainted with the older one. So I never. I still haven't seen the older one. But yeah, that that new one looked deadly. And I know that you're that you're just a huge fan. Um, oh, it was so <laughs> bad. So I, I still remember that morning, by the way, and that was three years ago. So I I got up early. <laughs> And it's I, haunted you. I know. I, I, I went to the <laughs> Alamo Draft House. And I saw uh, Rogue Nation first in the morning. I was like, man, that was just a breath of fresh air in the action genre. I absolutely love this franchise. Vacation is next. Not even joking. It was in the middle of the afternoon on a Saturday. I was the only one in there until about five minutes in, and someone else came and sat in uh, one of the bottom rows. I maybe chuckled once. This guy, and I, I always will use this um, way to describe him. It's almost as if this guy was cryogenically frozen for like his whole life. He is un, he is uh, he is melted into society, and he's like, "What is a comedy movie?" And he asked the first person on the street. And they go, go see the vacation movie. And then he goes and he laughs his ass off because he has never seen a comedy in his life. That's how I equate this uh, gentleman because he was rolling on the floor. He was literally rolling on the floor laughing. I was like, sir, it's not even that funny. Uh, When you have your character swimming in like a garbage pit with needles and poop, then uh, you know that's where your your comedy's at. Oh, man, Um, I thought that was in Saw (laughs) 2. Well, uh, both. (laughs) Maybe not not the poop, but the the needles. Minus the poop part. Um, Yeah, minus the poop part. Yeah, it it was not a good double feature that day, but at least Rogue Nation was great. Well, Um, it's interesting because that exact thing happened with me, and and you're not going to believe the movie that it happened in. It was Meet the Blacks. Oh, no. Yeah, which I don't even know if you saw that one. Did you see that one? Okay. I, I watched like I the did... first five minutes of it because it was on Netflix, and I shut it off because I realized I had to go to the bathroom and I wanted to go to sleep. Yeah, yeah, it's it it didn't get any better. Um, <laughs> yeah, I saw that on the same day as God's Not Dead Two. That was an interesting day. Oh, wow. Um, anyway, but yeah, during that movie is when somebody next to me was cackling like a like I a know, hyena, right? and I and I was sitting there. I maybe grinned once. That's about it, and it was within the first five minutes. So that gives you an idea. I can't remember what it was at, but I remember grinning, and then that was it. I, I, I didn't engage with the movie at all. It's awful. One of, one of, my, one of my bottom ten that year. I, I, um, I want to do science or two, experiments. Or two of my bottom ten that year, really, because so was God's Not Dead too. So I, I want to do science experiments on people that go see <laughs> commies like that and just laugh themselves silly. And I'm like, what? What is this funny? Like, I want to I do experiments on you. Um, Are you a of, Martian? Uh, well, speaking of delicious comedies, Joel, um, so this past week uh, I had the pleasure of watching two movies, uh, one from A24, kind of a lukewarm movie. I would compare it to uh, getting a burrito, a frozen burrito from a gas station, heating it up, taking a bite of it, and it's like a lukewarm, you keep eating it, and then there's like a cold center, and you realize, you realize that this was like the worst meal ever, <laughs> but you know, it wasn't bad at the start. That's the, that's the way I describe it. It's a very bland movie. It was Hot Summer Nights. My review is on my YouTube channel. I also saw another one. Now, Joel might be playing my funeral soon. Because <laughs> when I saw the previous movie two years ago, I got blasted online for it. And I'm going to get blasted online tomorrow. Because um, the embargo lifts tomorrow. I will respect embargo even if I don't like the person. I was uh, instructed to release it on the 30th of July. I'm fine with that. What am I talking about? I'm talking about Death of a Nation from the good old Dinesh D'Souza, uh, the wonderful gentleman with great manners on Twitter. Um, you know, uh, when I saw Hillary's America, uh, well, quote-unquote, documentary, 
uh, two years ago. I, I said it was awful. I gave it like an F minus because I was just so uh, infuriated. But that's what D- D'Souza wants. He wants people like me to get angry at it so people in the comments can defend him and then go see his movie. It's a brilliant marketing ta- tactic. I will not uh, take it, take that away from that piece of scum person. But for this one, I expected to see another comedic one where it was just all bad reenactments. It's poorly shot, poorly edited, and just propaganda. It's propaganda all the way through, whatever. Death of a Nation is the same way. Uh, <laughs> I, without getting into my review because I can't right now, uh, I will tell you that when my review drops at 8 a.m. tomorrow, I'm expected to receive... More dislikes than likes. I'm expected to receive at least 50 to 60 comments, which is way more than I'm used to. And they're all going to be towards me uh, wanting to die and, you know, live hard and all those uh, fancy words that we love in today's political atmosphere. Um, so I'm just letting you guys know if I die tomorrow from angry mobs or whatever, it was nice knowing you. And uh, Joel will take over and he will... Um, <laughs> run the funeral. So, uh, so I'm just letting you guys know that that drops tomorrow. If you want to watch that one on my YouTube channel, so that was my week. Uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm basically I, I, a dead I, man walking at this point. I do not envy you. Um, I've still only seen 2016 Obama's America, which I watched for a class um, back in 2013 or so. It was actually to illustrate the points of a terrible historical documentary. I kid you not. That's what it was about. Um, how not to research essentially. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was extra credit and I was glad to do it. Uh, but I, I decided then I was like, yeah, I'm not watching any more of this fool's movies. It, it was terrible. I didn't see America. I, I didn't see any of the other movies. Well, this is weird. He's, he's actually made the first movie without the word America in the title because I didn't see, um, <laughs> even though he's obviously referring to it by a nation, um, he, he doesn't actually have the word America, so maybe he just should say death of America. Keep, keep the, uh, keep the theme going. Uh, but yeah, I didn't see America imagine the world without her, uh, which is such a great title. And then I didn't see Hillary's America, the secret history of the democratic party or whatever it's called. Well, you know, um, without giving anything away, this death of a nation, I think he actually goes even more bonkers than usual. Um, no lie. I am not making this up, and all the the right wing pundits can throw that fake news term at me all they want. But this is literally what is said in the documentary. Uh, uh, D'Souza interviews Richard Spencer, the beloved white nationalist of this country, and he's like, uh, "So you would consider yourself a progressive, right?" And Richard's like, "Yeah, yeah, I, I would." He's like, well, "Who was your favorite president? Uh, probably Andrew Jackson. You know, I just loved his democratic strong <laughs> views." And then D'Souza had a voiceover. It's like he didn't say. See, I told you it was more of like, well, that was unfortunate or something like that. And it's like he's basically comparing Democrats to white nationalists and uh, Nazis. And I'm like, wow, he's really off his rocker in this one. So it wasn't more funny like Hillary's America. It was just more sad. Like it was just just sadder as it went on. So whatever. (laughs) That was my week. Um, So I I enjoyed watching that. Um, I should have had some (laughs) beers or hard liquor before I watched it. But, you know, it is what it is. (laughs) So. I, 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 I look forward to watching your review. I will I will it's I will watch minutes it. Long. And then it, and then I promise for your for your, oh wow. Uh I promise for your <laughs> um for your funeral I will deliver a rambling uh distracted eulogy. Uh don't don't worry about that. So Okay, perfect. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm glad you will uh, represent me well. So uh well <laughs> in, until my death, Joel, we got we got to move on uh, with our lives and so what what's been going on this week in uh, movie news cuz <laughs> there was a lot of stuff that dropped. Yeah, there's there's quite a few things, uh, mostly in the casting, and then there's this random other thing that we'll, we'll get to. But oh god, um, yeah, it's gonna be very interesting conversation. Let's just say that. Um, so there's some casting news. Uh, the biggest casting news is the fact that Star Wars Episode Nine is apparently going to include both. Well, I don't say both. It's it's um, Richard E. Grant has joined. Of course, he was uh, the main villain in Logan. Uh, really solid actor, though. Uh, and then Carrie Russell's in it. Naomi Aki. I don't know who that is, but that's one of the new uh, new cast members. Um, but there are some returning cast members. Uh, Billy D. Will- Billy D. Williams, of course, is going to be coming back as Lando. We'll get to see him, you know, uh, as he currently is, rather than an earlier version of him, which is pretty neat. Uh, of course, they were going to do that. Um, Anthony Daniels is going to be coming back as C-3PO, of course. Uh, and then Mark Hamill is going to be coming back, I assume, as a Force ghost. Uh, I can I can only assume that that's how 
Um, he will come back, uh, but that's that's some pretty big news. I, I assume that it's going to be in an Alec Guinness type way, you know, in in um, Return of the Jedi, um, and um, Empire Strikes Back is just kind of this occasional appearance to offers either wisdom to Ray or the usual what he was um, his his bitterness that that he had in life uh, in his late life. But the biggest one is the fact that apparently there's going to be unused footage. Um, now used in this movie of the late Carrie Fisher um, as Leia. And, you know, this is, of course, going to be the bittersweet thing where um, a year, you know, more than a long time after her death, we're going to be we're going to be seeing her in a movie. I mean, it, it happened with um, just recently, actually, it was his voice, but it was still him. Robin Williams was in a movie that came out last year. Uh, he was a voice in this directive video movie called, I think it was like Absolutely Anything or something like that. It was, in, anyway, um, he was in that, you know, you had like Bernie Mac in that Old Dogs movie like a full year and a half after his death. So this happens occasion, occasionally, you know, stuff gets unused or is unfinished and then finally comes out at some point. You know, uh, uh, of course, the big thing this year is Orson Welles has a movie coming out and he's going to be in it. So, you know, there's the stuff like that. It's it's always bittersweet to see um, these things. And for a big Star Wars fan like myself, I probably will get a, a, a bit misty. It's 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 um it's interesting that they're doing this. It makes sense though, um, and I'm glad that they're not going the uh, the zombie Tarkin route uh, route of uh, of Rogue One and and you know using a double and then recreating or whatever. I have a feeling that. You know they're gonna frame in some way her retirement in you know in some light from from the fight uh, is what I'm guessing will happen unless they unless you know they they kill the character off I I, I don't know why they would do that uh, maybe to to prove that she's really you know a strong um, a strong voice in the rebellion uh, in particular maybe doesn't ever want to. Uh, Retire from that, you know, maybe that'll be it. We don't know yet, but apparently it's going to be included in this, and uh, it's very interesting. So I uh, just wanted to get your take on that after the full segment. But the next couple of be- uh, bits of news, I'm not going to spend so much time on uh, because we don't really know, honestly, uh, a big part of this. But um, Robert, De Niro- Robert De Niro is set to join the cast of the Joker movie, which is really interesting considering he's the king of comedy. He's kind of returning to this, this area of, you know, sort of psychodrama, um, psychodramatic stuff in a movie that's going to be, um, fairly dramatic. Obviously it's going to be Joaquin Phoenix, but, um, De Niro is going to be playing a talk show host who is instrumental in the Joker's origin. Um, I don't know what that means. Um, I assume that at some point there's... I, I, I just... I don't know. It's it's going to be interesting. And then Zazie Beetz, who was Blink, or... Uh, she was... Um, not Blink. <laughs> Blink? Uh, I, I, she was Domino. <laughs> sorry. She was Domino. I, I don't remember all these names, guys. I'm not like a nerd. Well, I'm a nerd, but I'm not, I'm not a nerd about that. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, guys. Okay, you can you can make fun of me in the comments if you want. Um. Uh, anyway, <laughs> wow, I can't believe I did that. But she's gonna be also joining this cast, uh, which is pretty cool because I liked her as Domino. Um, she was she was fun in Deadpool too, and uh, I haven't really seen her in anything else. I think she's on that show Atlanta, right? That's that's where she got her start yes. or something. Yeah, which I haven't seen that either because I don't know how to. I I'm, I I don't know. Anyway. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Uh, Natalie Portman is going to be playing dual roles in a movie, uh, about both Ann Landers and Dear Abby. Uh, now, of course, they're actually, um, twin sisters in real life, Esther and Pauline Friedman. Um, and they're nicknamed, I didn't realize this until I was looking this up, but they were nicknamed, uh, you know, amongst each other and their friends, Epi and Popo. Uh, so Epi and Popo are going to both be played by Natalie Portman. Uh, this is really cool. I got to say, because Ann Landers and Dear Abby are fixtures of people who actually read, uh, in, you know, newspapers and stuff. I, I Mom would read this. This is a, a regular thing for mom um, to do. And you should, you, know, you should never send any letters in. But it, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I got to say, I like, I like the... Um, 
I like the idea of doing this because it's a really interesting story. And uh, there's a lot of feuds. There's a lot of real drama here. And, uh, yeah, I just – I really like this idea. It's going to be an interesting story. Um, and then a couple more bits. The Charlie's Angels reboot has been cast. I could not care less about this. Uh, I haven't seen the show or the movies. But Kristen Stewart, um, Ella Belinska, who's a newcomer, sort of. She's on the show called Midsummer Murders that I hear she's pretty good on, although she doesn't play a big role. Um, and then uh, – Naomi Scott, who was one of the Power Rangers in last year's movie, uh, up-and-coming star for sure. They're going to be playing the three leads, um, and it's going to be uh, directed by Elizabeth Banks, who, uh, of course, probably brought Naomi Scott over. <laughs> um, she played Rita in that one. Um, yeah, I, I think that – first of all, this is, this is something that uh, an article reminded me of. This is the first time that Stewart will be in a blockbuster since Snow White and the Huntsman. Well, I guess technically Twilight Part 2, the last one. Yeah, so that movie. But whatever the case, a movie in 2012 is the last time uh, she was in a big, big summer blockbuster like this. So it's pretty neat. It'd be interesting to see her shift back into that role after having been – uh, in a lot of indies, you know, particularly for uh, Clouds of Sills Marie. And she's done commercial stuff, but she's been kind of away from that whole uh, scene for a long time. She kind of got burnt out on it, as I, as I understand. So clearly she's, you know, she's kind of recouped. She's ready to go back, and this is going to be interesting. Um, I thought that Scott, I thought that Naomi Scott was one of the better things about Power Rangers. You like that movie more than I do. Uh, I thought that she was really promising so that'll be cool uh and obviously i don't know anything about Belinska, but um but i like i like this uh and then the last bit of uh casting news so to s- is is um is interesting because disney's got a streaming service uh coming out we've reported on that uh something that i'm probably not going to <laughs> sign up for um or i'm just gonna <clears throat> mooch off somebody else's if i have to um but Justin Theroux is kind of getting ready to hit, you know, the the or is hitting the the marketing campaign for the Spy Who Dumped Me, uh, and and obviously, you know, together with that, he's got this um, uh, Lady and the Tramp movie coming out, and he's going to be joining the cast. Uh, I believe that he's he's apparently going to voice the Tramp, uh, who will be. Uh, It'll be interesting. I I don't have a great like rela- not well. I don't make this sound bad. I don't have like some deep relationship with Lady and the Tramp. It's a good movie. I haven't seen it since I was like seven. So this is not one that I came back to as an adult or anything. So I I will have to rewatch it uh, soon. You know I I essentially only remember the the spaghetti kiss um, as I call it. Um, and so this is interesting, but yeah, I, I, I don't have a lot of feelings about this. Maybe you do more than I do, but um, anyway, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. What do you think about all this casting? Well, I mean, to start off with the top, um, going to the bottom, you know, the Star Wars stuff, that uh, totally makes sense to me to bring all of them uh, kind of back, whether they use uh, old footage or bring Luke back as a Force ghost. Um, it, it's really funny because... Uh, when they announced the casting of Star Wars 9, that was when we heard about Fox uh, Disney merger deal being approved by the Fox shareholders. And I was like, oh, mm, that's, yeah. that's funny. Um, and so <laughs> now that Disney's going to have all this in you know, the next year and a half or so, they're going to own Star Wars completely yeah. now. Um, yeah. Cause, uh, we'll, we'll finally be able to get the original um, – theatrical cuts on blu-ray potentially if they decide to do that hopefully they do oh or four, you know or, they four, do. or bob, 4k yes but bob Iger is going you know what like that that like that's his first mission in the star wars universe is to release those on 4k do you know how much money they're gonna get off of that oh my gosh, it, yeah it's gonna, it's gonna be insane so um they're all, they're all out of print the dvds that that had been re- originally released you know back in the early 2000s um, they're all out of print. They're eBay items now. You can't really find those on, in stores. And uh, you, you, if you find anything, it's the it's the newer cuts. And so we have we have them at work, uh, all of them. <laughs> but that's just because we're lucky like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can't really find them on like uh, you know in a new in new uh, in a new capacity. 
at a store unopened or, or whatever. Maybe you could find it like from someone who owns it, but you can't find it in a store. So it's really cool that they'll, that they'll have, um, uh, that they'll be able to have the rights to distribute those. Cause you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a purist. I don't hate the, the cosmetic changes that they made except for the singing, whatever dude from return of the Jedi that they inserted. But the original cuts, of course, are the ones that I'm most familiar with, having watched them 700 billion times as a, as a child um, on VHS. So it'll be really nice um, to be able to to finally see those again. Uh, I would certainly watch them. And, uh, yeah, it's a great, great piece of news. Anyway, I'll, I'll let you go. Well, no, I was just I, – I love hearing about that stuff from actual Star Wars fans because I could care less if they release it, but as a business right. move, <laughs> it is one of the most – genius things they could do because everyone is just foaming at the mouth for those things uh oh yeah yeah so but with the they're, the whole... they're essentially the holy grail for us at this point yeah exactly uh, it's, it's, it's like no, the the they're, they're they're those things that we can't that we can't have anymore if we don't already have them yeah and <laughs> right. you know years years ago of course we either gave a gave them away stupidly um although i guess not stupidly because eventually our vcr stopped working but um <laughs> Anyway, we, we gave them away years and years and years ago. And, you know, obviously by the time that we gave them away, the DVDs were already going out of print because they were so, you know, they were limited release. The um, the new versions had been released in 97. And, you know, um, and so it was kind of nice because we, uh, you know, we'll be able to get that now. They'll, they'll obviously put them out on 4K. They're, they're definitely going to scan them uh, through to 4K to a 4K version, which will be great. Um, and maybe they'll actually put the other movies on 4K too, because the only one that's been released is The Last Jedi. Um, uh, Force Awakens, I don't think even has a 4K yet. So they'll be able to put all those on 4K. It's pretty awesome news. And uh, yeah, so for for folks like me, this is like this is awesome uh, because I mean, not the whole merger in general. I, I still dislike it, uh, and this is not a a thing that I that I just you know that that. Um, uh, that justifies the merger. I, I I still hate it because it's corporatist nonsense. But if this is going to be one of the things that comes out of it, it's kind of a good thing coming out of a bad situation. Um, so yeah, that's my that's my thought. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like like I said, you know what? I I don't really like the merger either, but we have no control over it, and it's just it's going to happen. Yeah. So <laughs> let's just buckle up, folks. Um, but as far as bringing all of them back, I'm excited to see where they kind of are placed in the story going forward. I, I love The Last Jedi. It's actually my favorite one so far. So yes, throw your pitchforks now. But I, I, I'm excited to see kind of where it goes, where it kind of wraps up, and they stop this trilogy before... I'm hoping that they kind of stop the trilogy movies for a while, focus on kind of like other worldly one-off movies before they go back into that world but hey whatever i'm not uh in charge of lucasfilm right yeah now. even even as a diehard star wars fan what i kind of want them to do is even if it's just like one trilogy per per decade yeah which like would be one fine. which would be great uh, especially like in the latter half of the decade it gives us it gives us something to tie a bow off of the decade you know so in 2029 let's have an episode you know 12 or something that ends an, an every two year or or even every three year uh, trilogy because of course that's the three year thing was what they were originally that it was seventy seven then eighty then eighty three and then you know ninety nine oh two and oh five and then they kind of they kind of narrowed the gap um, I think that that's an easy thing to do but you're right though I I don't want them to just you know crank out you know a bunch of trilogies all at the same time and then just alternate it I I think that they need to build the universe. In a way that's um, more interesting than they've than what they've done with Rogue One and Solo, and I like both of those movies, but they easily could be better. And I think that there's a way that they can just kind of build the world by by giving us new characters. That's what I want. And I think that if this Biz Disney Fox merger goes through, they're going to own even you know just even more of the Star Wars universe than they already do. Not just the original trilogy. They're going to own you know rights to you know other things too it just it just i don't know i don't know what to name them but it's just going to happen there's there's going to be other things that they own and so they'll they're going to have that kind of freedom um and they really need to start utilizing it in a way that doesn't for instance get solo to lose money for disney because that should not be happening with a star wars movie and if they can get new characters you know we're we're going off on a tangent now but if they can get new characters and stuff and make movies about them that'll be awesome 
uh, and oh, you and know, along what, alongside what's great about you know bringing all the older ones into this kind of like final episode nine to where they're probably going to wrap up everyone's stories. It's just it's a great segue yeah. into those new characters and kind of new universes that can tell stories in. So you know, I, I'm hoping this works out. I, I know people. There's people out there that are very lonely, lonely, lonely people that hate The Last Jedi and they just hate life. And, <laughs> you know, of course, their mom didn't uh, restock the corn dogs in the freezer. And so they, they just have a really pathetic life and they just they hate everything. And it's just these people I just, just need I, to grow I, up. I like how many times you said lonely and and with very incre- lonely. Yeah, <laughs> very lonely. Uh, oh. but no, I, I'm, I'm excited to see them all be brought back. And uh, I, I know if people out there. Uh, saying that the whole Force Ghost thing with Luke is a spoiler that you guys had like eight months to watch it. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, but I'm assuming all you guys have so far. Um, the Robert De Niro and Zazie Beats thing. Sure, I, I want to see this go down. Listen, a lot of people that were you know against this idea are just like, why are we doing this? Like, you know what? They're moving full steam ahead. They're shooting this thing now. I just want good things to happen out of it. And if you're gonna add Bobby De Niro and Zazie beats in it, then yes, go for it. And if this is DC's attempt or Warner Brothers' attempt to do a more Oscar-friendly type of superhero film, I'm totally down for that. If Logan can prove us anything, that if they can get nominated for adapted screenplay, which is huge in this genre, then other movies can do, do it as well. You know, of course, Heath Ledger with supporting actor in The Dark Knight, and of course uh, many other Marvel and DC movies get nominated for all the technical stuff, so it is possible to break through, but if you're adding Joaquin Phoenix, Robert De Niro, in a Joker movie, which is going to be very character-driven, it's going to be more of a character study, this could possibly, if it turns out good, now if it could be a complete train wreck, but if it turns out remotely good, Joel, we might be taking crazy pills and be talking about Joker in the running for Oscar nominations next year. Like, that's just, that w- wouldn't even come across in my mind until now. Uh, so, yeah, you know, as, as crazy as it sounds, I'm all on board now, so you do what you need to do, uh, WB. Um, Natalie Portman, sure. I, I will. Wa- she's one of these actresses to where she can do whatever she wants and I will watch it. Um, I love when she takes risk whether it be like a black swan or like an annihilation and just does all these weird type of movies that you would never expect her to do. And then she completely delivers in. This is the same way where this is a very kind of rich story. It's something I would never expect her to do, but the fact that she's going to star in it and direct it, I'm totally on board for. Um, I kind of like the fact that she doesn't really do that many major blockbustery type movies anymore and just kind of does like either middle movies or like independent film and i i could not be happier about that i guess she was just kind of tired of that system and she was like listen i i actually want to do like interesting things that speak out to me so hey you you do you portman you do you um the uh charlie's angels i could care less just like joel what's fascinating about kristen stewart I actually think like she is a great actress. Like her, what her and uh, uh, Robert Pattinson have done post Twilight has been nothing short of phenomenal. Now Taylor Lautner somewhere selling tacos in Mexico, but that, that's besides the point. <laughs> now they these two out of the three are really great actors, and I like the fact that they've been kind of doing all these independent roles and really just being these powerful presences on screen, you know, whether it be Kristen Stewart and all the ones Joel mentioned in like personal shopper or like Robert Pattinson and the a wonderful, amazing movie. Good time last year. And he's done many others before that, but I think good time is probably the pinnacle of post twilight. So yeah, far. it's, it's his, it's his best performance, either that or the Rover, which the I, Rover's I thought pretty was good too. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, I thought he was great in that. Um, yeah. And then Kristen Stewart, I mean, Personal Shopper was almost my best actress winner last year. She was phenomenal. I mean, not all. Well, maybe not almost, but uh, for a long time, she was my best actress winner last year. Um, but and, it, it, but I, to touch upon what you said, it is very weird to see her go back to blockbusters, considering that she's been doing so well in the indie space. Now, yeah, yeah. I like her to death, but I will say this: I don't know if she's the right 
choice for something like this. Now, I don't mind if she wants to bounce back between blockbusters and indie films. That's not the issue here. It's the actual material that I have an issue with. When I think yeah. of Charlie's Angels, I think of, I think of you know, spies, assassins, you know, this sultry type of character that just you know uses their sexuality to get what they want while also kicking ass and being strong and. I can't see Kristen doing that, and it's not because she's not a good-looking woman. It's because of how her presence is, where she yeah, just doesn't seem I, charismatic to me. You know what I, I'm saying? I, I get your point. I mean, I think that she's capable of charisma because I think that I, I'm generally an optimist. I think any any actor can work in any role with the right direction. Right. But but you are right. There is a there is a you know if she if she felt like if she felt awkward in the Twilight movies because she comes across as a person who's a lot more progressive than the character in Twilight. And so, you know, she didn't super enjoy making those movies. And I think it was because she was a bit of ahead of the role in terms of it just was a bit below her. And that was the problem with her performance in those movies is she felt wooden because she felt or it felt like she was not very comfortable with the material. So it'll be interesting to see how they rework this whole charlie's angels business to accommodate that um because uh yeah it's just it's just gonna be interesting and also um i honestly think that her least interesting mode is as lead in a big budget movie because i'm not a fan of snow white and the huntsman uh, just as a movie i think it's dull I, you know, I wasn't a fan of the spinoff either but just the the first movie to me was dull but even she just she just felt like it, it was it was just walking wallpaper to me, and not that and again it's not that she's a bad actress. I just feel like maybe there's a, a an element of her personality, you know, maybe she needs the money and, and maybe that, that's why she's doing this. In which case, you know, it's a business. That's fine, but there's just an element to me that it feels like she's a little above these kinds of roles. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, and it's not just because I feel like it, it's because I genuinely feel that she feels it. And I think that she's a lot more comfortable working with Olivier Aseas on movies like Personal Shopper, The Clouds of Sil Sils Maria, both of which were great performances, uh, in, in good movies, but they were great performances. And, uh, you know, and she was also really good in, uh, that Billy Lynn movie, uh, from a couple of years ago. And she was... You know, she's just been really good in in these smaller roles for such a long time, and I just I just feel like this is this is it's an interesting turn, and I'm I'm curious to see how it turns out because it could be that this is a totally like different approach than um you know I I barely remember the other movies I don't even know if I saw the second one the full throttle um but I I definitely saw the first one and I you know it was it was whatever and so if they take this if they take a, this approach to that, or if they take that approach to this, then I don't know if she's going to fit. But if they rework it in some way, then you know maybe she'll be maybe she'll be a right the right fit. It'll be, you know, clearly there's something. She she's not one of those people who just picks a project because it's big. Um, I think she's actually even been uh, vocal about the fact that she reads the screenplays. So there must be something here that she just had maybe she just had fun with in the screenplay and she's like okay yeah i want to do this this looks like a lot of fun you know maybe it's just coming at the right time where she just not is running out of money but she just needs that you know that boost or or something um or she feels like she needs that boost some some sort of money money issue um or money situation i don't want to call it an issue but money situation where you know this is obviously going to make money so you know she wants she wants a little bit of that which is again that's fine i i don't look at actors as greedy for doing that because this is a business you know you're, you're doing work sometimes you got to do some big stuff or or crappy stuff in order to pay off something or whatever and and that's fine uh i just it'll be interesting to see how they've they've reworked the whole um kind of rhythm of this group of spies now well, of course she's I'll, not i'll, I'll also she's, bet you money that it, this could be a very offshoot chance that this happened but what if all three of them got in the room and they had great chemistry 
and that's why they picked these. Oh players. yeah, for sure, for sure. That that's obviously that's another thing. I mean, uh, maybe maybe at some point there was the thought that maybe this wouldn't happen, and then they got all all got in a room. Elizabeth Banks or whoever realized, oh man, I want this to happen because these people really get along, and then that then that you know it kind of took off from there. It's 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 certainly a conversation. Um, I will say that you know. Kristen Stewart is not totally I'm, – I'm about to bring up a total blast from the past, but she's not totally new to the espionage thing. She was in Catch That Kid back in 2004. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> leave. Leave the show now. Drop what you're doing and leave. Hey, now. Roger Ebert gave it thumbs up. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's wonderful, Joel. We don't have to like everything that Roger has liked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as our listeners know, we love each other. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, yes, yeah, it's, it's certainly really interesting news all around. Um, all right. So you you had a couple more to, to talk about, I think, oh, yeah. right? Uh, I, as far as, like, the other two go, um, I don't know much about them besides Naomi Scott and Power Rangers, so I can't – but Kristen Stewart's the biggest draw, so that's why I kind of went to her first. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, Justin Threw um, – I love that man. I, I don't care what he does. He could be in the stupidest of comedies under heavy makeup or a mustache or whatever, or he can be in something as awesome as The Leftovers, or he could do um, kind of drive. Other... Yeah, exactly. So uh, he, is, he is great in Mulholland Drive. I mean, obviously, yeah. the whole <laughs> surrounding that movie is Naomi Watts, who gives one of the best performances of the century so far. Yeah, but just through is is excellent. All the people in that movie are excellent. And so even you're if he right, does he's, something as as dumb sounding as Lady in the Tramp, I'll probably watch it just because yeah. he's such a likable dude. And yeah. I don't say this often, I like his wife quite a bit, uh, uh, Mrs. Jennifer Aniston. But I like him more. If I had to pick between the two, if like they both had a movie coming out on the weekend and one's in one movie and one's the other, I probably would go see Justin's movie. Uh, just because I, I I I like his uh, on screen presence and he can do no wrong. He can do either is, these adult movies or kids movies. He just he has he can, that look. He can write he can write screenplays. He co wrote yeah. the screenplay for for Tropic Thunder. He he wrote he he wrote the screenplay for Iron Man two. Which still blows my mind. <laughs> which is crazy. I just I still wonder. I haven't ever watched any sort of making of. I just wonder how he got looped into that. Honestly. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's the only thing he's ever done in the MCU. Well, did, wait, uh, I thought you the were the one play. that brought up the fact that he probably got roped into it through Tropic Thunder. Because oh, yeah, yeah. R- I mean, what on, I mean is, yeah. like, I want I want a specific story. Oh, like, specific, how, yeah, yeah. How, did, how did that happen? Yeah. How, <laughs> how? how? Because it's the only thing he's ever done in the MCU. He right. wasn't involved in the screenplay for the first one. He hasn't been involved in anything since. I don't even think he's been in any of the movies, right? So, I don't think so. Yeah, I, don't, I can't think of. I mean, obviously, that's a deep cast, and it's a lot of people to think about. But yeah, it's just really interesting, really, really interesting. So, all right, moving on from the casting, there's a couple of small bits. Uh, James Franco is going to be directing an ESPN movie for Focus Features. Uh, this is actually based on a book uh, called "Those Guys All ha- Have All the Fun Inside the World of ESPN" um, by James Andrew Miller and Tom Shales. And James Franco is in talks to direct an adaptation of that. That's going to be sort of in the vein of the social network and Moneyball. Um, I will say that I like this idea because I'm certainly interested to see it. ESPN was the first, uh, 24 hour cable TV network. I don't think that people quite realize that because we've had these 24 hour news networks for so long, but they were the first. And so it's certainly interesting to see how that all, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that all comes together. You know, I'm not a sports guy. That's, that's pretty much my only draw is seeing how all of that, um, comes together. Um, the only thing is that I kind of want them to now bring in Aaron Sorkin because he wrote The Social Network and he co-wrote Moneyball. So if they're trying to go for that route, you know, get somebody who was involved, for instance, in the in the show Sports Night. You know, somebody who likes sports a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously this is going to surround Bill Rasmussen, uh, who was an executive who's teamed up with his son to to launch this. And it's going to also surround, you know, some of the other big, big names there, um, Stu Eby, Chet Simmons, Al Perinello. It's going to involve the bigger, the big, you know, the higher ups. And uh, I like, you know, uh, despite his problems, I like James Franco as a director now that he's had something as good as the disaster artist. Um, and if he can if he can take that sort of sensibility, not this, not not the comedy aspect, but sort of that just solid, uh, solid kind of 
hybrid between Hollywood and indie product that he b- delivered with the Disaster Artist, which was just very confident filmmaking. If he can take that and do it with this, this should be really good. Um, and I'm I'm just I'm very interested in this. Um, even though I'm you know again I'm not you know I'm not I, I don't really watch people sportsing around all over the place. Uh, I'll just I'll just put it like that. So sportsing around all over the place will go down. Yeah. It's probably the quote of the year for you. Um, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I, I actually like this idea quite a bit. I like uh, James Franco's you know work as a director and even an actor to some degree. Um, even with his you know problems he's got outside of his movies. If we're talking just strictly on his art and what he does, he's very and, good and I, at. In an ideal world, maybe he shouldn't be involved in anything anymore, given what he's been involved in. But if if he has to be involved in something, this is, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know. You could do worse. Well, I mean, and here's the thing when people get ousted out of this business is that you can be one of these people, like a Spacey, where you have so much stuff, like, uh, from your past that just comes creeps up on you to where you don't want to work ever again. Then you have some like James Franco who he knows the ramifications if he comes out and j- does something else, and he's still going to do it. So I, I don't know. Uh, you know, we're not a, a a rumors and tabloid podcast, but you know, it's just it's weird to me that you know he'll want to get back out there. Maybe that proves his innocence. Maybe that doesn't. Maybe he's trying to hide it, move on. I, I have yeah. no clue. But maybe maybe his best option, and I and I know that this is not going to be seen as a good solution to a lot of people and. Whatever. Again, I've already I've already been vocal. I think that the best option is for him to not do anything. <laughs> but right. if he has to do something, maybe he should just direct. Yeah. Uh, you know, not not be in any movies. I know that that would be kind of a big shift for him because he's kind of gotten into this rhythm. And then and then these and then these ac- accusations came out, and they should have. But perhaps the best route is for him to just kind of direct, stay behind the scenes, don't do any interview any interviews. You know, just kind of just kind of be there. You know, be at the Oscars if you only only if you need to if you're nominated or something. Um, but, you know, and I, I have a feeling that if he actually does stay in the business, then there will be an Oscar nomination for Best Director in his future. I, 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 I suspect that that's going to happen. Uh, it's going to happen at some point. Well, right? and so, who, who knows? It, it might be this one because – Yeah, if, it might be. If this, is, if this is released like – I don't know if it would be ready for next year because it definitely seems like early, early uh, movements. I don't know. I think that the script is being rewritten. So, you know, it could be that they shoot it next year for a 2020 release, in which case – it might be one of those that's in the 2021 uh, Oscar season. That means the um, that the Oscars take place in early 2021 for the movies of 2020. I think that that's uh, – yeah. So anyway, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, I was just going to say that throughout his filmography, he's very good at making uh, dramas, and that's kind of been his wheelhouse. But I actually think doing The Disaster Artist is actually a step closer – to how he could do this ESPN movie because Joel's right. If they can nail it in terms of like a slick editing style and yeah. really sharp dialogue, get, like the get social the Senate, network and um, uh, you know, uh, and Moneyball and Moneyball. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah. Um, if they can do it <laughs> in that vein, oh, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be great. But what Franco's got to work on, and I'm hoping that he really, you know, kind of pours his uh, heart and soul into this directing gig. Is that this movie is going to rely on its its script and its editing, and if he can nail the pace of that movie, it could be one of the best edited movies he's ever directed. Because I, yeah. I I like his style, but he's more of a lethargic director where he lets things kind of soak in the moment, and he's he's a very like kind of breathable director. This is going to be one of those fast paced things, so and, I'm excited. And to maybe. See that and maybe they should even like maybe he should get the cinematographer from the disaster artist Brennan Trost because mm-hmm. that was that was a good pairing. Uh, I, I I maintain that that is a good looking movie, even if it's standard cinematography. It's great, um, you know, just very crisp. And they should get that, and then and then they should get, go full social network by getting the editors uh, Kirk, yes. Baxter, Kirk Baxter and Angus Wall because this is obviously going to be very fast paced. It's being described as a uh, corporate biopic, which means it's going to be about all of the people, not just Rasmussen. It's going to be about all of these people to some degree. So it's going to be an ensemble biopic. Uh, first of all, that's probably going to be pretty long, which is pretty neat. Um, and two, just get Baxter and Wall because they edited the heck out of the social network. And um, you know, second to only, the in- only Inception, for me, it's the best edited film of 2010. Um, it's somewhere between those two. And um, – and then you know they came they came back around and did Dragon Tattoo, which you know even though I don't like the movie, 
uh, is well edited. So they should get those guys and then, you know, this, his cinematographer from Disaster Artist. It could be a really good, big uh, crowd pleaser in, in, a, in a certain way. I think that there's going to be a big audience for this. Well, uh, if, if those, my, guys, my if those dad, guys are busy, my, uh, you could always get the editor of Whiplash because th- that guy can do <laughs> Tom no Cross. Wrong. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, somebody who knows how to edit, like, a lot of complex stuff together really yes. well. And Tom Cross, Baxter and Wall, Michael Kahn, uh, or, um, yeah, uh, Michael Kahn, uh, Spielberg's editor, you know. Yes. If he's, not, if he's not doing something for Spielberg, he's one of the best editors in the business. Uh, and, he, and he knows how to put a lot of complex stuff together. So... Uh, get a really good editor, an Oscar winner or nominee, and this thing is gonna is gonna sing. It's gonna it's gonna do really well. My dad is is perfectly within the um, the audience for this, so I'm gonna tell him about it uh, <laughs> when I get done here. So, um, and then the uh, let's see, just a quick one because I don't really know much about this, but uh, Ryan Reynolds is doing an R-rated stoner riff on Home Alone called Stoned Alone. Um, and I and I definitely I definitely know why um, Chase included this because this is very much a Chase Lee movie. Um, <laughs> this is going to be something that you watch, and if it's good, you're going to like watch it 78 billion times before the end of that year. Um, I just I just I just know Chase too well, guys. Uh, it it sounds stupid and fun. It's it's um, you know it's it, it it'll it'll be interesting to see what uh, what happens here. Um, and it's going to be uh, a female director. Uh, for this, it's going to be Augustine Frizzell, who's actually about to come out of the gate with Never Going Back, uh, the movie from A24 that comes out next month. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, yeah. All right. So (laughs) here's the deal, folks. I'm super excited about this. And, you know, Joel's correct. If one of my first R-rated movies as a kid that pretty much shaped my personality was American Pie, then you know I'm going to like stuff like this. So that, 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 let's get that out of the way right now. All right. So with this idea... I, I love it. I cannot wait to see this. Are you kidding me? Like a stoner <laughs> version of Home Alone. Please. That that just – it reeks of wonderful gag jokes and like perfect setups. Like I just – oh, I cannot wait to see this. And the thing with Ryan Reynolds is I've always liked him, uh, even in his earlier days, way before Deadpool, where he would do um, – uh, his goofy stuff like a Van Wilder. I was always a fan of his dramas or his thrillers, like a Buried or I like the Voices as a good dark comedy. Uh, he's even not bad in his romantic comedy stuff like Just Friends or Definitely Maybe. So he's actually always been on my radar even before Deadpool. But that Deadpool's kind of brought him into a new light now. I like the fact that he's just kind of doing whatever. Like he's taking that money, he's taking that that fame and popularity now. To basically be like, you know what? I'm going to roll the dice and do something like this. And you know what? I say go for it, Mr. Reynolds. You go for it and you have uh, Blake Lively support you and you guys joke each other uh, on social media. Which is, by the way, they're one of the the cutest, most funniest couples uh, in Hollywood. Because they always riff on each other. Uh, and Reynolds is always fighting back towards Blake. And she's always fighting back towards him. It's, it's great. But... Um, as far as a movie premise goes, it's genius. And if you do not get, if you do not get Macaulay to come back, then you are doing this wrong, <laughs> and this movie will be a sham. If 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 you tell me to my face right now that Ryan Reynolds has not already had a phone conversation with him or even his people, <laughs> then you are lying to yourself. <laughs> he is already getting Macaulay back to do this, and he's going to have his long hair again. He's going to look like he did before he got clean. It's going to happen, and if it doesn't, I will be super upset, but if I know Ryan well enough uh, just through his antics on social media, he has already reached out to Macaulay to do this, and what I cannot be- wait to see this. What would be rich is if he has actually done that and he's and he's getting him back in and then he decides that if it's going to be an R-rated stoner riff, we got to in- incorporate a bit of danger. Imagine if there's an opening scene in which a Macaulay Culkin's character is <laughs> living in a house and is pursued by potential, you know, uh, intruders and tries – to do all of the things and then dies anyway. And fails. That would, that would be such a great fails. opener. That would be awesome. I mean, I was just thinking about that. I was like, oh my gosh, what if they did this and then killed this character off? Oh my God. <laughs> I think just... they're actually going to do that. I think yeah. you just called because the honestly, first like 10 minutes of the movie. 
I know. I, I, hopefully it actually happens and then I get like a story credit. Um, anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, no, this uh, – but because it, it, it makes sense because there's a lot of – if you know and have seen interviews with Macaulay Culkin, there was a lot of period of time that's sort of like Jake Lloyd and, and all of those child actors from the 90s. He resented the – uh, you know, the recognition that he got, the, the, the number of times he was asked to make the face. Now he's kind of come to terms with it recently. He, he had an interview, uh, I think it was a couple years ago where, you know, he said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it now. And if he's fine with it, maybe he's fine with having a sense of humor about it. Yeah. And if, and the best sense of humor is to, is to revamp your role and then kill yourself off. It's, it would be brilliant. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I think that that would be absolutely hilarious if they did that. I, I'm totally in for this idea too. Um, and I will be exponentially more excited if we, if we get any sort of word that Culkin's involved, it, it'll be, it'll be great. So, uh, our final bit of news is oh, a very, okay. Guy, but before Joel gets into this last bit of news, buckle up. It's going to get, uh, really fierce from Joel, right? Joel rarely yells on this podcast. Okay. I have well, a feeling that he might do it on this. No, I'm not because I actually am, am leaning two ways on this, and I know that that seems weird, um, but uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna get there. So this is an interesting bit of news. Now, since 2014 or 2015, kind of, um, that movie Mowgli has been in the works, and it was originally set for like a 2016 release, and then the Jungle Book came out, so. They moved it to 2017, and then they moved it again because uh, Andy Serkis went off and made that movie Breathe. And then, um, you know, now it's supposed to come out this October, and it's not. It's uh, Netflix, being the $700 trillion company that they are, has bought it from Warner Brothers, which I have many questions about how that happened. But that's a whole other discussion. Um, they have bought it from Warner Brothers, and they are uh, setting it for a 2019 release at some point. Now, at first, you're probably thinking, wait, 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 wait. This is a big temple, temple project. It's like a $90 million movie or something like that. It's, it's kind of low budget for a big blockbuster, but, you know, pretty big budget in any case. It's, you know, this big movie, it's clearly going to be special effects oriented. There's a lot of actors with, um, you know, uh, doing performance capture here, uh, including Circus himself. He's going to be playing Baloo. And, you know, you got Christian Bale, Benedict Cumberbatch, a bunch of other people, and uh, Kate Blanchett, all that. And so, you know, clearly this has to be in theaters. All right. And that's what I initially thought. I was like, okay, this is this is ridiculous. Why are they doing this? Why are they taking this big, potentially very visually stunning? And we've talked about this. The trailers are pretty stunning visually, at least. You know, big, big visually stunning movie. Um, why are they doing this? Why are they dumping it at home? Okay, here's here's the thing. Scott Mendelson over at Forbes, I'm crediting him for all of this. Uh, well, for most of this, because he didn't bring up the other part of this that I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the second half of, of a consideration. But this first part, I'm crediting with uh, crediting to him because he made the point that Warner Brothers is kind of stretched a bit thin in this latter half of the year. They got the Nun in September. They've got Fantastic Beasts in November, and they've got Aquaman in December. And so to release a, a big budget movie right in the middle of all of that is kind of is kind of a risk because what you have is, you know, obviously people are going to have moved on from The Nun, which is going to be a big hit. That's going to get Warner Brothers a lot of money. But then they're going to have to figure out a way to start the whole campaign process for – advertising Fantastic Beasts and Aquaman, which are really close together already. They're only about a month apart. And so that's going to take a lot of a lot of work. And what's going to happen is that from the months from the you know in the latter weeks of September and early weeks of October, uh, or whenever this is going to come out, um it it would kind of get swallowed up. And I think that this allow now there's a whole other aspect to this why didn't they just put it in theaters in 2019 and i'll get to that in a second but um it, it was kind of smart for them to realize the 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 monetary aspect of this if they want to be able to make their make their money back then they have to put it somewhere that people 
aren't going to be completely overloaded with other movies in theaters. And so it was kind of smart for them to do this. It's weird considering it's such a big movie. Okay, then there's this other thing. Why don't they just put it in theaters in 2019? Well, guys, I actually recently went through and counted the number of just big event blockbusters. This is not counting animated movies. This is not counting big studio comedies. This is not counting, you know, anything else. It's just the big event movies. And there are 23, 23 of them that are coming out next year. That's an insane number. I mean, it, it might not seem like it, but it is. That's a, that's a, an equivalent of two per month, which we don't really have a lot. Even January has two big movies. And so if you, if you shift it, that adds to, that adds another aspect of release strategy. Then if you don't release it on something like Netflix, where it might be that if they, if they, um, you know, market something like this really well, then they would just have to move it to 2020. Then you're just moving it and moving it and moving it. Otherwise, it's just going to get lost, and it's going to be one of those stories that people hear about where this lost Mowgli movie with – or Mowgli, sorry. I keep saying that. Um, lost Mowgli movie uh, from Andy Serkis with a bunch of visual effects is one of, the, is one of these movies that was made and never released. It's going, to be, it's going to turn into a story. So this was really the smartest move that they could make in their situation and because otherwise you're just, you're just looking at a bunch of movies at the same time. This one is – you know, it's got a title that doesn't really immediately connect for a lot of people to the story. You know, they always think of the Jungle Book or or whatever. Somebody else, they don't think of Mowgli as the kid. And so, uh, I, I I just I think that this was this was this was actually kind of smart for them. Again, it's weird. So I'm leaning that way too. That maybe they should have just kept the release date. But then again, you know, if they want to be able to make their money back, they got to they got to put it in a market where they can do that. And Netflix obviously keeps a lot of their stuff under wraps. Uh, maybe they have already made their money back, you know, through Netflix, uh, you know, them buying it or, or whatever they do. The, the secret, you know, um, espionage that they perform that allows them to uh, to pay for these movies. And uh, yeah, I just I think that this is the smartest move in their situation. Any other situation, if this was like one of two movies of theirs in in the fall, then I would be like, what? You know, why would they do that? But it isn't. It's one of four big movies, and I think that I think that they were kind of strapped. They were stretched thin, and they realized, okay, we gotta we gotta make a a bold move here. Let's let's give it to people at home, and then they can watch it there, and uh, and we still make our money back. So that's my thoughts about it. Um, but I do not know yours. So do you disagree with me? Did you, did you consider that part of it or, or what's, what's going on in that head? I didn't consider that part, but after hearing you, I am convinced that it was probably the best decision. Now, the only way for them to make their money back is if, let's see if the movie costs about, uh, you said about 90, right? Yeah. So if they double that, maybe well, they wouldn't. If they, I don't know if they would have to double that. If it's if it's not going in theaters for, True. maybe they'll have like a maybe they'll have like a week long presentation. I, I can't imagine I, this I, not I at all think, playing in theaters. I still think that they still charge out the wazoo to get the distribution distribute distribution rights. So my guess is they probably charge straight up like two hundred mil. Uh, to acquire that, and Netflix is like, "Yo, we have an endless bank account because someone's funneling money into us, so why not?" It's Tommy. It's Tommy Wiseau. I'm just kidding. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so, with that said, they probably actually, you're right. They probably actually made their money back plus some, and they made a profit off of it. And so, you know what? It, looking at it now, it's probably the smartest business move. And whoever greenlit it in the first place is an idiot, just because when you have a movie that's almost the same story comes out two years prior and makes almost a billion dollars. Your movie's going to get swallowed up and yeah. you're, you're right. They have fantastic beast coming up. They got Aquaman coming up. They have four DC movies alone next year. They have the conjuring yeah. three next year. They have, they have so much stuff to worry about and you're right. The nun's going to kill and the nun is going to go into the Halloween season. That's going to, that's going to swallow up any type of Mowgli uh, action anyway so yeah and what? then also next year don't they have um the uh what was it the the crooked man i don't know if that's next year or the year after but i think it is next year 
Yeah, and, I think it is next year. And hell, since so. they shoot him in a weekend, they might have Annabelle three next year too. So uh, <laughs> probably so. You know what? So after they have a they have a they have a stacked 2019. Oh yeah, it's it's way more movies than they released this year uh, in, in terms of these these kinds of wide releases. Yeah, it's, uh, the, the, insane. The, so they are going to be totally fine. I'm not worried about them. But as a business move, I think it is the smartest. And the reason why I say that Warner Brothers probably charged them out the wazoo to do it is because if the Irishman which is a pretty basic movie. There's really, I mean, there's going to be a lot of CGI in it from the, you know, reverse aging thing. But if Netflix had to purchase that for a hundred million, imagine what Warner Brothers charged them for uh, a CGI heavy movie. It's, it's probably in the, like I said, in the, in the ballpark of any, anywhere between two and 300 million. I mean, it's going yeah, to be yeah. a good price tag for him. But, hey, you know what? If Netflix is like, this is going to get us a lot of business, um, let's do it. And I'm totally for it. My my question is, who is the one that decided this? And who is the one that kept this story so quiet that no one else picked it up? Because we all, we only heard about it until Netflix acquired the rights so during yeah. the whole process of them shopping it around how come we did not know about this like Man, did they just and- randomly call netflix up and be like hey <laughs> so secretly i think we're not going to release this in theaters can you you guys want it or whatever and they're like hell yeah we'll take it and it's like who india ndas yeah. man ndas I, right, I know that yeah. Net- netflix is generally very secretive yeah uh it seems like this happens a lot though they'll i mean we'll maybe sometimes we'll get word but then suddenly you know Netflix has bought this thing, right. um, you know, especially from like a, 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 a festival or something. If they bought a movie, the news is not that they might, which sometimes is what happens. We'll, we'll get wind of some, you know, uh, studio swirling around a movie. Um, and, and then, and then we find out that it's bought. I've, I've noticed that generally with Netflix, what they do is they probably have them sign an NDA. Like, yeah. you know, there's, there's no press release allo- announced uh, allowed for this until we announce it. And so I can imagine that there's um, well, that they, there's major. They did the in, same thing with uh, when they bought uh, Paradox, Clover, Cloverfield Paradox, yeah. off of Paramount. They didn't announce yeah. it until they actually said, "Hey, we're streaming." Yeah. So there there must be there must be major NDAs around, uh, you know, rumor rumors maybe. Uh, you know, you can't just don't send out rumors about this. We'll 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 announce that we're actually doing this, and that'll be the news. We don't want people thinking about it. Maybe it's a business. You know, maybe it's like an image thing. I I, I don't know, but. Yeah, you're you're totally right. Um, all right, we've talked about this stuff for like two hours already. Let's uh let's blast through these trailers. Let's uh, do it, uh, Chase. Yeah. So bring us into the first one. So the first one is a good look into how Joel and I grew up in the mid '90s. Um, it, <laughs> yes, it's very, exactly very my accurate. childhood. Yeah, it's very <laughs> accurate. We grew up on the streets of L.A. Um, <laughs> as, as we skateboarded. Uh, no. So this one's called Mid '90s, and I'm proud to report, um, uh, without any hesitation, this is my favorite trailer. Um. <laughs> this one is written and directed by Jonah Hill, and it comes to us from A24, as uh, they are just releasing everything good nowadays, um, for the most part. Um, but this one, very simple, it, it tells the story of a boy growing up in Los Angeles in the 1990s. Now, I made that joke earlier, but Joel and I, we did grow up in the 90s, but we were still children. This is more focusing on teenagers in the mid '90s, so we yeah somebody somebody around like the 1983, 84, as in born correct uh, then yeah that that sort of range yeah yeah so uh, you know uh, we did yes technically grow up in the mid '90s but we were not in the age group of this so until they make a mid you know 2000 2010 movie about <laughs> teenagers growing up then we cannot relate we we will never relate <laughs> uh, so uh, but this one. Very simple. Uh, like I said, we follow this young boy, and we kind of see his his home life. We see him uh, interact with his friends. We see him skateboard. We see one of his friends potentially moving. We see him and Lucas Hedges interact, um, and he just basically gets advice from everywhere as he's growing up, and it looks like it's going to be in a very questionable neighborhood, and it's going to be riddled with crime, and it looks like he's going to try to struggle to survive and you know ask questions because he doesn't know things he's a child and so he's growing up it's a coming of age story but it tells it in a more grittier style and really grounded on such a level to where it looks like documentary footage rather yeah than it, it also film. looks it also looks very loose and improvisational yes uh to me that that um you know sometimes these movies do this and i know that you hate this movie but american honey did that you know there, there was True. there was a, a an aspect of um Obviously, naturalism is a limited term in cinema, but 
a very naturalistic uh, version. It's certainly not realistic because it's it, it looks like there's there's a, um, a specific perspective that might um, sort of cushion some of the some of the realities of of live of growing up as a teenager in L.A. But certainly it looks very naturalistic in terms of the actors, and I love seeing Lucas Hedges in a in a in a context like this, it's really interesting. Um, well, especially him. since we saw him in the Boy Erase trailer where he's very yeah. reserved. Um, he's really yeah. outspoken in this, which is great. I, I like the fact that he's going to be kind of a mentor to uh, the mm, little kid. Yeah. And so that's um, – I, I really enjoyed this trailer, by the way, just the way it was cut, the way it was presented, the way the, the acting felt so raw and genuine. And then, of course, the you know the look of it, it's boxed in. It's a four by three ratio, not a sixteen by nine, so that's going to add to the vintage look of it. I I love it, dude. I really have nothing more to say. I'm, um, I know you I'm really a, liked it. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the four by three ratio after Ghost Story and First Reformed. Yes, I think that I think that it's such a rich. Um, it, it's boxed in, but it but it but it actually heightens the images that the that the directors have to work with, and I think that it actually heightens the work that that the cinematographers do too, because both of those movies looked incredibly rich, um, full of depth. And it's because they were boxed in a little bit. They had to, they had to make do with a smaller aspect ratio. And I love that. And I, and I think that this is going to work just as well. I'm a huge fan of this trailer. Uh, it's not quite my favorite trailer of the week, but it's close. It's uh it's kind of a tie between, uh, this one and another one that I'll get to later. So, um, well, the next real, tra- real, real quick, Joel, like, we have to mention this because as long as Joel and I do this podcast until the day we die, we will remember 2018 as one of the best years for for directorial debuts. Yeah. Like, when you talk about Jonah Hill, Bo Burnham, <laughs> Boots, Riley, it's like, holy crap, dude. Ar- like, Ari Oster, Ari yeah. Oster, who it's is crazy. already working on his next movie for, for A24. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty great. Uh, in, in Intensely good time. For um for for debuting feature feature debuting directors, some yeah. of them have directed shorts, but um and I know Jonah Hill has directed I think at least one short yes um in in the past, but yeah it'll be interesting to see how how that how that goes because uh, I'm I'm a fan of him as an actor um and uh, yeah it should be interesting he's obviously been on enough sets to get a sense of how to direct and he's obviously directed something before you know even if it wasn't a feature so. I'm excited. Uh, our next trailer is really good too. It's called Bad Reputation. Uh, this is a documentary about Joan Jett. Now I'm all for these kinds of documentaries. I loved Amy. I loved Whitney, which I reviewed recently. Um, you can name other ones too, but uh, documentaries that open up the life of a particularly, you know, potent, uh, you know, sometimes controversial, sometimes just very interesting um, musical legend. And this one is Joan Jett. And uh, you know, I'm not super familiar you know i i know the hits but i don't know the deep cuts so this will be interesting i don't know much about her life either so um yeah i'm, I'm really interested in this it's a well-cut trailer uh and i'm i'm excited to see it for sure uh were you were you driving to this trailer i, I absolutely was and you brought up you know whitney and amy i, I have not seen whitney but i've heard great things and i absolutely love amy i don't know what it is with musician documentaries as of late especially with, like you know it's not like one of the the best ones but we still you and I like that Sammy Davis Jr. one, so it's yeah, like, yeah. I don't know what it is, what's in the air, but all these musician documentaries are absolutely just powerful pieces of um, documentary filmmaking, and I'm not, like, uh, a w- more well-known into, you know, uh, her music with the Runaways or, you know, when she did s- stuff solo or whatever, but I, I do recognize her songs, and that, believe it or not, I'm not even joking, the first time I ever heard of Joan Jett was when I purchased or not purchased when I played guitar hero one and it was either (laughs) bad reputation or something else was like literally within the top like first five songs. And that's how I got introduced to her. No lie. So, um, wow. But I I like her music quite a bit. And I, I think bad, bad reputation was the first thing I heard too. I wasn't in that context, but yeah, it was, it was the first song. It was either that or cherry bomb, but Oh, that's right. Um, she did Cherry Bomb. Yeah, she did. She did Cherry Bomb. That's a really good song. Uh, I like that. I like that song. Uh, Bad Rep- Bad Reputation is great as a song. Like ju- a, a just real like thumper, if that's a term. I don't even know if that's a term, but that's what I'm going to use. Um, all right. So then our next trailer is a really crazy, wonky looking thing called Hunter Killer. Uh, this is an action thriller starring uh, Gerard Butler, 
um, and Gary Oldman in uh, uh, basically a story about how um, there's a uh, kind of there's an attack on a Russian president who's abducted and they have to figure out maybe they should save him, maybe they shouldn't. So they hire a guy played by the late Michael Nikvist um, to anyway, it, it doesn't really it, it, honestly, the, the trailer's kind of disappearing in my mind. It doesn't look great. But I will say it looks kind of silly in a fun way. Uh, I like the earnestness of the trailer. Let's just say that. I, I think that as a trailer, it's cut well. It sells the movie well. The movie doesn't really interest me. Um, I, I don't think that this looks like they're taking full advantage of this kind of premise. But um, Oh, and we also get you know Common uh, and Linda Cardellini. It's a really like random selection of people <laughs> because you have Gerard Butler you know, and – and um, uh, Gary Oldman kind of makes sense together, but then Linda Cardellini, who was once Velma in the Scooby Doo movies, you know, and and was in Freaks and Geeks, is, has this history with comedy and and all of that. And then Common is in here, you know, and I guess that makes sense. But yeah, it's kind of a weird random selection of people. So I thought that this was an okay trailer for kind of a dumb looking movie. Uh, what did you think? So uh, Battleship Two, where is Common's? <laughs> Beard is the name of the movie. Um, by the way, I'm not even joking. The whole time while I was watching the trailer, I was not paying attention to the story. I was not paying attention <laughs> exactly. to the because I was so distracted by Commons missing his beard. I was like, yeah. where is his facial hair? He it looks so looks, weird. It looks really weird. It <laughs> so, looks really, really weird because he has no hair on the top of his head. He's got a shaved <laughs> no, head. So no. it's it's just – it's very disconcerting. Yes, yeah, so that, that was my number one question about the trailer. Uh, wh- where is Common's beard? Hashtag Common. Where's Common's beard? Um, um, <laughs> thank you, thank you, John Oliver. <laughs> right. Um, um, <laughs> no, uh, Hunter Killer. It just it looks so cheesy. But you know what? If Gerard Butler can make his career off of this these cheese fest type of movies, then you know what? God bless him. Hunter Killer just it does not look good. And I, the trailer was. Um, very generic, but my favorite part was at the very end. Um, I don't know who edited this trailer, but this the the final shot did not warrant the uh, the drop in music and then the rise in music to end as your final shot. It was like a submarine, and then there was a cloud of smoke, and then the m- music drops, and then it comes back up as you know very cli- climactic, and then the submarine just kind of bursts bursts through the the clouds very slowly, and then the the trailer just ends. I'm like, wow, what a very <laughs> Um, flaccid final shot. Um, no, but uh, it, it is what it is. Uh, but I think the most disconcerting thing, Joel, and we're gonna have at least a thirty-minute extra long episode podcast over it, is how <laughs> Common looks extremely weird without his beard. So that is my thoughts on that. Extra material. We'll uh, we'll 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 sign up for Patreon just <laughs> for so that you beard. can all pay for an episode in which we talk about how. Common does not have a beard in Hunter Killer. Um, <laughs> all right, so what's the next trailer we're going to talk about? All right, so the next trailer uh, I, I really enjoyed. It kind of came out of nowhere. It's called The Happy Prince, and this one is written, directed, and even starring Rupert Everett. Uh, it also stars uh, Colin Firth, Emily Watson, and this tells the, the story of um, the last days in of uh, Oscar Wilde's life and you know just kind of seeing – uh, where he was at as a person, and um, kind of see, you know, just just kind of him interact, interacting with a bunch of people because not many movies have been really made on him. So it was kind of interesting to see uh, this kind of perspective. He's now, he was he was pretty enigmatic, and and there's there's a lot of uh, yeah there's a lot of mystery surrounding this guy. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, so you know, it, it's a very good trailer. Um, I'm not gonna say like it blew my socks off or anything, but. There was a lot of critic quotes praising Everett's uh, performance and the fact that he's directing it and he wrote it. Like this feels like this could be one of these movies that is the pinnacle of his career. So that's also good. Um, Colin Firth looks solid. It just looks like a really good um, period piece on this uh, this gentleman. So I have really nothing more to say. Uh, it could be one of those like kind of sleeper hits in the indie world where Joel and I watch him. We go. Wow, that was actually really good. It caught me off guard on how good it was. So, um, very solid trailer uh, indeed. And if if this movie can hit in any regard and get a lot of traction, I think Rupert Rupert Everett's going to be uh, the main um, kind of attraction for awards if this thing goes anywhere. 
Yeah, so this is my favorite trailer of the week. Um, ah, gotcha. I, I, yeah, I knew that. I, I I suspect that maybe when I said that it would surprise you, maybe this was what you thought. I'm I thought not trying to be our, our our final one. Oh, we're our last about. one. Um, no. Um, <laughs> but well, no, that's, it's a weird dismissal. But no, I just didn't want to talk about the trailer yet. Um, but yeah, no, this this looks excellent. I think uh, Everett looks great. Uh, Oscar Wilde is a person that I find fascinating. Uh, just as a human, he he just lived a very interesting life. Um, and I think that Everett's performance looks looks amazing. Uh, he's he's obviously put on a lot of makeup. Um, you know, he doesn't look much like Oscar Wilde, uh, so they had to they had to you know uh, shift with that. But it just it just looks excellent. It looks tenderer than usual. Um, period biopics. Uh, I, I just I thought that the the thing that he's doing with his camera seems very Tom Hooper esque, and I mean that in the best way because it looks like. You know King speak King speech ish to me, which I'm a big fan of King speech. Whatever people say about whether or not it should have won Best Picture, that movie is a deep human story, and I found it incredibly moving. And I think that this looks to be in that same kind of uh, milieu. So I'm I'm absolutely in for this. Uh, I, I I think it looks excellent, and this and the mid '90s trailer are by far my favorite trailers of the week. And who, who uh, would have thought the the villain from Inspector Gadget would be uh, redeeming? <laughs> Get off the show. <laughs> there, there, mentioned... There's my get off the hey, show moment. You you mentioned something way worse than catch that kid. <laughs> That's true. Uh, that that is not a that is not a uh, that is okay. not okay. That is not okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess if you had said this about that French Stewart guy, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, that would have been worse because of the movie that he was in. Yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, which we don't speak of. It's uh, Satan. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> All right, so our last trailer uh, is a movie. This is actually a trailer that's been floating around for a while. I don't know if you've known this, but I just forgot to add it, I think, uh, the week that it came out. But it's Operation Finale. Uh, this one is a story about catching one of uh, Hitler's main lieutenants. I think his name is Himmler. I think it's Himmler, um, played by Ben Kingsley, um, which is interesting casting, considering he was in Schindler's List as a helpful person. But um, anyway... Uh, yeah, this one this one stars Oscar Isaac as well. Uh, it's got a great cast, uh, but yeah, it looks it looks solid. I, I I think it's weird. It's one of those movies that looks better for its cast than for the movie. Um, I, I I think that the movie looks looks solid, very uh, certainly dramatically engaging. Um, maybe not maybe not the most adventurous thing in the world, but uh, Kingsley looks really. Uh, really cool in this role. It's um, yeah, I, I think it's a solid trailer. I, I I wasn't sort of like you with the happy happy prince thing. I think it's solid. I wasn't blown away. Uh, so yeah, are you in the same boat on this one? I don't know. It's kind of weird. Like I actually like this trailer because of the cast, and it makes the movie yeah, yeah. ten times better. And I never would have thought that my boy Nick Kroll would be in a movie with Ben yeah. Kingsley and Oscar uh, Isaac. That's awesome. It's it's sort of like, you know, I didn't see it, but it's sort of like when he was in Loving. Yes. Um, which, I, I again, I didn't see Loving, but he was in that movie in a very dramatic role, and I hear he was terrific in it. So it's interesting. I, I guess this, you know, he has the range, and, and sometimes he, he just finds these, you know, these screenplays kind of fall on his lap, and he's like, okay, well, I'm going to I'm gonna shift a little bit. I'm going to... I'm going to do less of Uncle Drew, and I'm going to do more of this thing um, where, you know, it's more dramatic. And, and I get to be with Ben Kingsley and Oscar Isaac and and whoever else was hey, in listen, this movie. I, I hard to keep ba- track, actually. I said this back in 2009, and I'll say it again. The first ever episode I saw of The League, and I was introduced to Nick Kroll. I said, this guy is one of the most genius improv comedians I have seen on TV in quite some time. And I knew he was going to blow up from that or blow up from that first episode. And now look where he's at. The league is done, sure, but now he's doing, you know, comedy roles, uh, whether they be stupid or not. And he's doing dramatic roles. And it's like you never would have thought in a million years that he would get to this point. So yeah, good on him, man. Um, but yeah, the, I, I, I like the trailer quite a bit. The the douche has come a, a long way. Um, <laughs> oh God, Sasha's yeah. party. I still yeah. remember that oh, when man. I heard his voice, I was like, "Oh no, he's playing <laughs> his character from his uh, the Kroll show." I was like, Ugh. <laughs> "Oh, gross." Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Which I, I, I I genuinely believe that um, his performance on Parks and Recreation was one of the best things on that show. Oh, yeah, um, I he was because on that. yeah, because that's what I'm saying is he's the douche um, mm-hmm. in that in that show. 
he was he was one of the the radio program thing uh, guys and he yeah. played and obviously he played the the douche in, <laughs> in, the, in the sausage party but um yeah it's interesting um but i mean because uh just, uh, uh just real quick uh, just go back to the trailer um i actually like the cinematography quite a bit i think it looks yes, very yeah. very clean and I- i'm always a sucker uh joel knows this uh, i hope you guys know this i don't even care if the movie looks awful i will watch anything that deals with World War II, post World War II, anything that deals with people in World War II, I will always watch it, and that's all yeah, I have to yeah. say. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely a fascinating period of time. Uh, all right, guys, those are our trailers. Let us know what your favorite is. Mine is The Happy Prince and Chases is mid nineties. Uh, and yeah, just leave some comments with what you loved. Um, we're gonna get into our reviews now um, of. The main review, which is Mission Impossible Fallout. Uh, This is the sixth film in the Mission Impossible franchise and the second in a row to be directed by Christopher McQuarrie, who is the first filmmaker to repeat business in this in this franchise. Um, All the other four were directed by different people. So that's pretty neat. Uh, They clearly thought, you know, Rogue Nation worked out. So uh, and it did. Uh, This one catches us up with um, Ethan Hunt, of course, played by the great Tom Cruise. Um, he, uh, he has, he failed to kill the, uh, villain in the previous movie played by Sean Harris and, and who comes back here. Um, and that has come back to haunt him because, uh, the syndicate, the big gigantic terrorist organization that the villain worked for has set off three massive nuclear bombs in holy lands across the world. Um, uh, Mecca, Rome and uh, Jerusalem, I believe. And um, so that kind of comes to a head here as uh, there is a person who releases a manifesto, uh, basically stating the whole thing that the syndicate stands for. And uh, they are uh, Ethan and his team of Luther and Benji, played by, of course, Ving Rames and Simon Pegg, are sent to retrieve the plutonium that was responsible for this attack um, and or uh, more of the plutonium responsible for this attack. And uh, that doesn't really go well. And so they are sent off to find the perpetrator with a new agent played by Henry Cavill. Um, And yeah, so that's pretty much all I'm going to explain here. Uh, But essentially I guess the other thing is that they, they end up going after a, uh, a broker played by Vanessa Kirby from The Crown. Um, yeah, so I, obviously I love this series. Uh, I guess I'll just uh, I'll just get into my review. I love this series. I love these movies. I rewatched them all previous uh, uh, just recently because I wrote an, um, an appreciation for the much maligned second film in the franchise, which is my favorite and is still my favorite. Um, so I love this series. All of them are top 10 contention movies. Even if they didn't make the top 10, they're, they were certainly in the, in the running for their particular years. And so obviously I was excited for this. It looked very dramatic. Um, that trailer set to the Imagine Dragons song Friction was just stunning and the best trailer of the year so far. So I just, I loved, I loved everything about the marketing for this. I love the series already. So of course I was down for this and guys, it, it, it satisfies this, this thing is, I will just, I will just say first, that it has a plot, and I've already pretty much laid out all of it, um, except for the, you know, obviously the, the twists and revelations that happen in the third act. But um, it has a plot, but this series has never really been about plot uh, so much. And they, they certainly thread together a series of action sequences, but the series has been about the action sequences. It's been about how Cruz performs his own stunts, and he does that here probably the biggest stunt that he's ever done and the biggest stunt that he could possibly do which is which might be why it's rumored that this is the last film to feature him either in the either in the series in general or just to feature him in the series um because he does a halo jump here high altitude low open out of a out of a plane and uh it's it's amazing to witness and he, he has a lot of those kinds of things he you know is probably green screen work some of it but he rides a motorcycle through uh the wrong direction of traffic, uh, you know, in Venice, he, at the end, he and the, the main villain kind of, uh, duel with helicopters, which I thought was pretty awesome. So, you know, there's that. And it's all about how 
the series is able to thread a, a bit of a plot between these sequences of action that are sort of like musical numbers. I, I, that's, that's, the best, that's the best description I can give, is that they are musical numbers. Um, they come in to, to give us a sense of how good the director and, and actors and technicians are at staging these sequences of uh, great complexity. And that's exactly what a musical is. And so here, you know, you have the big, the big set pieces and, and they're all just so good. And I think, and there, and then of course there's this bathroom fight, which, in which the, the movie decides to play on, um, this image of Tom Cruise as the unstoppable force, which in recent movies has been kind of a, the point of a joke, you know, in Edge of Tomorrow, he stars as a guy who dies every, you know, every hour or so and comes back. And that's, not something we we were used to, and as bad as it was, mummy the mummy featured him getting his butt kicked by a bunch of you know whatever uh, <laughs> whatever they were uh, in that movie. I barely remember that movie, but I just remember that he gets beaten up a lot in it. And you know, so there so clearly movies recently are kind of making fun of fun of that, and we get that here in a scene where he and the Henry Cavill character and another character are engaged in a fight, and Tom Cruise actually ends up coming out looking like the worst person in the fight. He's always tired. He's always hit by someone. And meanwhile, Henry Cavill's like this human steam, human steamroller who just, you know, even if he occasionally is also, you know, beaten up, you know, to an extent, he's, he always tends to come out the best. And so, you know, you have that and that's able to poke a little fun at, at the, the image that we have of Tom Cruise. And so this has always been a, a series about threading a plot with uh, – at the service of the action sequences in the best way that that can be described as. It's not just obviously style over substance, although there's a, there's a, there's a contingent of that. But it's all about stretching the legs of the filmmakers and the actors and the technicians to give us sequences of uh, great – enormous complexity like a dueling helicopter scene that then becomes even more intense and it's great i'm not going to give anything away about that but uh you know other than the fact that it exists in the movie we've seen it in the trailers um but yeah i mean it's just it all rides on the actors too and and cruz is solid he's always solid in this role he's a good a good solid presence but i actually think that that even more so a couple of the new people here have even more fun than him. Uh, you know, we have Cavill who at one point cocks his arms like they're shotguns, which is a really funny moment, but it's also kind of indicative of his character. This, again, this human steamroller, this human wrecking ball who is so solid. He's, you know, like six inches taller than Cruz and a lot more muscular. And um, so he's just having fun with that. And then we get the great Angela Bassett who shows up as the boss of the boss, um, Alec Baldwin, you know, is here again as the IMF sec secretary. Um, again, the, uh, the first time an actor has has showed up uh, twice in a row as the IMF secretary. Usually they they switch somehow. Um, but Angela Bassett plays his boss and she just comes in and commands the screen. Uh, it's it's one of my f it's, it's not like Oscar worthy, but it's one of my favorite performances so far this year. It's just so clear that she's engaged with this character it's a great piece of – there's a lot of really like uh, you know, kind of sass that she has that's really appealing. Um, and so we get that. you know, And we also get the returning you know, reliable people such as Simon Pegg who's a lot of fun, Ving Rhames who's a lot of fun. Rebecca Ferguson comes back as Ilsa under, under mysterious orders for a while. Um, and you know, we, get, we get some other returning characters and it's just – and Sean Harris is, is a nice little uh, – you know, threatening presence too, although he doesn't get a whole lot to do, but, um, but yeah, it's just these sequences of enormous action complexity. And that's what draws me to this series. It's just fun. It's like the Bourne ultimatum, the Bourne, the Bourne series, uh, in, in that, in that sense, it's just a great ride. Um, and then, you know, I mean, does it have problems? Sure. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the whole, the, the plot finds one character returning by way of this really huge contrivance. Uh, and you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, it's the glaring issue of the movie that they have to have that character returning because of course this might be the last movie to feature Cruz. So they have to have a reunion of sorts. Um, 
but how they how they do that is like baldly ridiculous and and contrived and uh even though you know she gets some of the coolest moments in the in the in the movie this this character it just how they do that is just a big problem i mean it it it, it's basically you know that character returns so that we get a bit of an exploration of uh ethan's nature uh this is the first time i think that, that it's done this ethan's nature as an agent with a covert squad He's always going to have to lead lead a double life, and we get a bit of that. Of course, it's not really explored beyond the somber reunion that happens. Um, you know, the 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 silent looks and and all that. I'm probably giving away who the, <laughs> the person is, but anyway, um, people won't be super surprised by by the return. But how they do that is just a big glaring issue. It's a way. It's a way to get that person back into the movie, and it just felt false to me. But um, that's really the only major issue, and it is a major issue because it's a big plot device. But uh, and of course, you know the other thing is that it's a very simple plot, very simplistic. It's just they're going around looking for plutonium, and there's you know a MacGuffin to find, there's a villain to unmask, there's um, you know stunts to perform. And that's it. That's uh, again, it's very simplistic, but it's so fun, and it's. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite big budget movies of the year, so I'm going to give it a B plus. That's my grade uh, for Mission Impossible Fallout. Is a B plus. Yeah, so you know I'm not like the biggest action movie junkie. I am very well aware it is a genre that exists, and a lot of people love it. I will go see them. I will enjoy them, and I can tell you if they're bad or not. Now, I always view action movies in two camps. You're either going to be fun uh and just a great piece within that genre or you're going to be so bad it's still going to be good so it's one of those things to where you can make a really bad action movie but still be like hilariously fun or you can make it like a really good one and push the limits to what you're capable of as an actor or director within that genre yeah mad max fury road is one of the best recent examples of this exactly um, in in terms of just not just confidence in the filmmaking but efficiency Yes, uh, it's literally just a big chase, but there's a lot going on within that chase. And yeah, you're you're totally right. It's it's all about the confidence that one has in one's approach to that concept. And yeah, so go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, I was just going to say that you know, speaking of the mid '90s, because we're going to circle back to that. Joel and I grew up in a time where there was a bunch of cheesy action movies and that's kind of what the genre was known for was like cheesy action with like Stallone or Van Damme and like that's kind of like the reputation that that it had but when you have filmmakers like a you know Mad Max uh with George Miller or even with these last two Mission Impossible movies with Macquarie it's clear to me that there are people out there that will take this genre which is known for being silly and turn it into a spectacle. And that's exactly what uh, MI6 is. I've been a fan of this franchise. I always love watching them, um, no matter when they come out, every two years, three years, whatever. I will always be on board with it because of the commitment that takes place. Now, Joel is correct. This isn't like some deep story that like it goes into like character psyches or we get to know a whole lot more people. It's like, cool, we get the gang back together and we go on another adventure. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with that unless you, you know, execute it poorly. And so the fact that Macquarie knows that this story isn't like it's not, you know, it's whatever. I mean, Joel's right. It's just a giant chase scene from getting uh plutonium from someone that's it that that's literally it i we could spoil it for you but it'd be impossible because that's that's it like there's nothing nothing more now whether to say they do it or not whether they succeed is the spoiler but that's basically the movie but i what from what i've gathered from you know rogue nation and fallout is that macquarie like centers the movie franchise around the action sequences, just like the previous ones, but more so with these last two and make uh, an exhilarating spectacle. And that's why I, I love this franchise and I love uh, fallout just as much as rogue nation goes pro. I, I like the whole franchise all for particular reasons, but McCoy is the star here. Him and Cruz know how to, make you feel like you're on the edge of your seat and feel like 
this is a real stunt. This is what is actually happening and not really um, use a bunch of, or it's minimal CGI, but you know, not use a lot of it to where it takes you out to really get you into the moment. Because if your story is about as basic as Tom Cruise going to three different countries and getting plutonium, you have to make it exciting to say the least. And you have to up the ante on these stunts. You have to, keep the audience interested even if the story is not and so when you think about uh you know the helicopter scene or running across the city or keeping the shot in where he broke his foot all Mm. of it feels bone crunchingly real and um if you if you play that shot where he does the jump between buildings you can see where it breaks and it, ugh, it makes you shudder. Yeah, they, they, they cut away. They do a really good job of trying to cut away, but it doesn't they, really They cut work. away, but, you know, when he, when in the movie. And then he gets up and he limps. And he limps, and that's the, yeah. that's the real shot where. And then, he, and then when they cut next is when he was better. But, yeah, yeah. It, it's, yeah. Um, it's still in there. <laughs> exactly. So, you know what? Uh, Cruz is one of the producers, so he actually probably has final say. So, if yeah, he yeah. wanted to keep it in there, it's like, whatever. Um, you know what I you know what I suspect happened is when he got better they redid it because I I'm pretty sure I heard a rumor of the fact that they actually redid the stunt but it must have been something that you know where they were just like okay let's look at the shots and the best shot was the one where he actually broke his leg yeah exactly and and yeah I mean it's it's brutal to watch because I was like oh my gosh I can't believe they just actually had that in there <laughs> you know I thought that they would have the 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 redo but. Yeah, and then of course they they kind of hide it with the fact that he gets up limps, and then they cut to like what he's looking at, and then back to him. And when they cut back to him, is is when you know months and months later they've they've come back to the scene, um, and uh, and redid and 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 redid that. So yeah, it's a great moment. But yeah, I'll, I'll let you go. Uh, well, no, I was just, I, I was gonna add on to that that I can't wait because I hope they have like uh, a behind the scenes things of all the stunts in the movie for the Blu-ray, and so I hope they. They have like a, a little yeah. section about that, and they're like, "Yeah, I broke my foot that day, and I wanted to keep it out of the movie, but we re- retook it. It was terrible, so we kept the the broken foot one." Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but that that goes to my point of Cruz is committed. Like whether you think of him as this Looney Tunes co- cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs type of character outside of movies, the guy is one of the most committed in the business. And when we get into the box office results, you're still going to see. That he is a box office draw. He is the white Denzel Washington, and yes. that's that's amazing. Um, <laughs> that's a good way to put that. Yeah, <laughs> he really he really is because and- because wa- really Washington, I mean, kind of predates him in terms of uh, star power because yeah. you know it was it was Denzel Washington first, and then Tom Cruise kind of uh, got his got his foot in with literally Mission Impossible was was really kind of the first movie that uh, you know we could call him a movie star. He had been in stuff, but. He had been this guy who was with who was in prestige pictures. He, yeah. he that's where he got his start. He was in, you know, he he got to start with comedies like Risky Business and stuff, and ensemble dramas like The Outsiders, and then he went into films like The Firm and and A Few Good Men, and then he did this, and then you know he's kind of in he's um, gone back and forth, you know, right after that, before even the first sequel came out, he he was with Paul Thomas Anderson in, uh, at the beginning of his career and Stanley Kubrick at the end of it. But he's still this big movie star because he's so appealing as an actor on screen. He's not appealing right. as a person off screen. No, but he's, not, not, he's, not so much anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's not only just a Looney Tune. He's, he's, you know, he's propagating, he's, he's, he's propping up this abusive uh, religion, that it, literally abusive, and... Um, and so that's awful, but on screen, he's got this appeal, this smile that is just, you know, bright whites and it's just, yeah, he's, he's Henry Cavill might be the next one, I think it, it, to, especially considering, you know, the roles that he's already taken on, he might be this next, this next guy who's just this huge star and, and it's neat to see them, you know, Cruz is getting up there. He's 56. He doesn't look like it, but he is 56. He's 56 going on 40. Um, <laughs> right. But, but you know, and Cavill is is not exactly young either. I think he's in his late 30s himself. But still, he's, um, you know, he's he's just this really appealing actor, and that's why I like him so much here. A lot of people have been complaining that he's dull in this movie, but I don't think he is. I think that he's playing – He's playing well, to his strengths. He's playing to his strengths, which is stone-faced, and he yes. has to be, and, and we won't give away why, but – 
he has to, although there's, there's not really no there's really no mystery there they kind of gave it away a little bit in the, in the maybe not to the extent that that we should but in the in the trailers they don't exactly hide his his, his uh uh you know his his job but it's uh it's it's a it's a really it's a really appealing performance. That's why I liked him so much. It's because he got this cruise quality to him, um, but he also looks like one of the stars of the fifties. He's got that kind of uh, Army Hammer thing going on, um, where he's got this great jawline, this great smile. He's got classical good looks. They could be the Clark Gable and um, uh, what's the other guy? <laughs> oh my gosh, um, Clark Gable, Cary Grant, you Cary know, Grant. kind of that, yeah. I knew it was like there were two CG actors in in <laughs> in that in that period of time. They they all um, had they all had the initial CG. All of them, Every yeah, all of them in the business. Uh, <laughs> exactly, Kenry Gonda. Uh, no, but uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, Con Gain. I, I I don't know. Um, anyway, but yeah, it's it's just it's just a great movie. You know what? I'm I'm actually gonna raise my grade. I don't care about the plot. This movie is so much fun. I'm I'm gonna go with an A minus. I'm just going to dip it up because it's such it's such a fun movie. There's there's so much going on here. That's I, I'm I'm just I'm just on the record. I'm gonna I'm gonna change my grade. It's an A minus. So what, wow. A minus. It, 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 yeah, no. Wow, I, that I, was I keep, incredible. <laughs> I keep talking myself into like either one of the grades. It's not an A because there are problems, but uh, you know, it's not a memorable plot. For instance, that would be if it had a memorable plot with like genuine stakes, it might be. Um, if they got rid of the forced way they insert a character, but. Um, you know, it has problems. I'm kind of talking myself in between the, the two grades, but I think I'm going to dip it up. I, I think that it's it's some of the most fun I've had at the movies this year, regardless of the of the caveats I have. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna dip it up. It's an A minus. So that, I'll let that you, let folks you has never happened before, where Joel <laughs> changed his mind in a matter of five minutes. Um, so there you go on that. Um, no, I, I really have nothing much more to say. Uh, in terms of you know the plot or the story, because I here's the deal, folks. I always view yes, yeah, storytelling is important, and this is actually a pretty engaging story. It's just not as deep as you want it because when it comes to the action genre for me, I don't look for deep plots. I look for execution in uh, directing, cinematography, editing, and this is one of the slickest and most well paced movies I've seen all year, and it's an over two hour long movie. Um, when you pair that, and it does not feel like it. No, it really doesn't. It like, really zooms by. It, it feels it, like an hour and a half, not two hours. And well, and the, the way I look at movies' links now, and this is weird for me to say, but I, I go to the Alamo Draft House like most of the time for my movies. They drop the check off 40 minutes before the movie is done. So if I start the movie, and then before I know it, they're already dropping off the check, I go, wow, that was already an hour and 20 minutes? That's incredible. Now, yeah. if I start the movie... And it feels like it's taking forever. Then they drop it off. I'm like, oh no, there's still 40 minutes left. So I actually can <laughs> gauge a movie like that, which is which is cool. And so when I saw this on Friday night, I remember it started, and uh, from the first like, uh, um, I guess plot switch reveal with the um, with one of the first bad guys. You know what I'm talking about with the hospital. From that moment on. I, I was locked in, and so I didn't really care about the time or the pace. I was just so into the the um, exhilaration uh, uh, of the spectacle of it. I, I completely lost um, you know track of time, which goes back to the editing and just making sure these action sequences are about as slick and presentable as possible to really have this kind of like kinetic energy to it. And that's why I really uh, like about it. So if you can have um, McCory's uh, amazing, you know, kind of direction. You can have gorgeous wide screen cinematography that just is really kind of awe inspiring. You have slick kinetic editing. You have choreography from these stunts that are just mind blowing. I can excuse the story a little bit. I can excuse uh, the way some of the characters are revealed. Like Joel said, we're not going to say which one, but that did bother me. And then also I felt like and this doesn't hinder my grade that I just would like to point this out. I felt like in this one uh Ving Rames and Simon Pegg were a little sidelined a little bit and I didn't really like that too much because a part the part of the appeal rather or just like the stunts is the interaction between the group and I felt like that was a little 
little lackluster in this one, but that's it did not... it, it it did feel a little more Ethan centered than than True. some of the other ones. It, it, you know, even though he is the main character, I understand that. But yeah, it does. There's a a lot of the the appeal of the other movies is the rapport. I I totally I totally agree with you there, and um, you know I think that Simon Pegg's work best work is still in Ghost Protocol. Yeah. Um, in the hallway scene, <laughs> one of the best scenes in the in the movies when he's trying to set up that camera thing. Yes. Yes. yes and. Yes. That's his best work because he's able to stretch his comedic chops a little bit. Here, you know, you're right. It's uh, he does get his moments, but he's actually used for a lot more serious stuff here. And I think that that it's um, like you know, it, it feels like Simon Pegg and Ving Rhames, and I don't mean this in a bad way. I just I this is the way I felt while I was watching them on screen. It felt like they were on set for two days and they left. And that's I don't know. They just I, I just wish there was more because they. I love it when, you know, uh, Luther's in the van and I love when Simon's like on the, on the ground with Ethan. And like, I love that kind of like interaction between all three of them to kind of, you know, get through these missions, but you're right. It is a more Ethan centric one. And I, like I said, these are just minor things, uh, you know, with the other character and, you know, his group doesn't affect my grade, but I, I would like to point that out. But man, uh, I, I gotta tell you the, the action sequences in this one, compared to Rogue Nation might be my favorite just because that helicopter scene had my heart pounding. I could not believe that Cruz was doing that stuff and it almost made me want to throw up because I hate heights and I had like this knot in the pit of my stomach, which, uh, which is great on an action uh, standpoint because, you know, I was, I was so into it. And then that bathroom scene, man, when, uh, when Cavill took off his jacket and he did the, the kind of like air punches with his, um, yeah, his arms. I was like, it's, "Oh man, it's about to go down." <laughs> it's it's such an amusing moment. I mean, it, it it's so quick too because in the trailer they they kind of keep the they seem to keep the camera longer on him in the trailer than in the than in the movie, which it just kind of co- happens in the background almost. And it's just it's really it's really fun. Yeah, it's really and, really funny. And, moment. and I have to uh, bring up a couple more things. Well, three more things. One. The soundtrack I love. Soundtrack mm-hmm. and yeah. score. It is such. Uh, this might be this might be Giacchino's best work uh, oh, on the it's, series. It's yeah. fantastic. Like he actually he incorporates. I know this is going to sound weird, but this is how I'm going to compare it. There are some action set pieces where he uses kind of like an Inception inspired sound mm. or, or score, and then in some he actually uses like black panther inspiration like it's mm. it's kind of interesting how he mixes everything but i think it i think it works um yeah and also uh another thing uh and then i'll get into a question for joel this has to be the darkest one in the franchise the deaths in this one and even the way the movie starts like this has to be one of the darkest uh in my movies did you did you feel yeah that way? Oh yeah, it's dark. I mean, and that's why I feel like probably this is the last one. Yeah. Um, or at least you know the last one with Cruz. I don't know where they would be able to go with this series if Cruz is not a part of it. But yeah, certainly it certainly seems to be the last one. I mean, it's it does go to some some fairly not despairing, but you know, it, kind of darker places. I uh, mean, the, right. the way yeah. that uh, let's just say the final battle ends with one person getting hooked on a feeling. That's all I'll say. That was pretty <laughs> brutal. I was like, yeah. I can't believe they did that. Yeah, that's uh, that's. That, I was like, whoa, they just did that. <laughs> I was like, this is PG thirteen, right? Oh. And they kept and they kept a shot on on that uh, on that. It, it, it was yeah, it was it, it was it was pretty crazy. So it, that that kind of jumped out to me. Uh, and then I guess uh, a question for Joel is, um, I I don't know if it's a given for you, but maybe you have other reasoning. What was your favorite? Uh, set piece in this one. Oh, definitely the dueling helicopters. Just that whole thing because it kind of reminded me of the big gigantic um, when Na- when Naomi Watts is caught on the teeth of one dinosaur and is hanging above another dinosaur in King Kong um, while a third dinosaur comes in and then King Kong beats them all up. That whole sequence in that movie was is one of my favorite pieces of action filmmaking of all time. And th- and the way that this kind of turns from dueling helicopters to, well, <laughs> again, I don't want to I don't want to say it, but the 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 okay, I'll just give the 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 tiniest hint. But the the helicopters leave the air, and then it goes 
further than that with 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 downed with downed helicopters. It, it's it's hard to, it's hard to talk about it without giving away the game, but it just it just builds and builds and builds on itself. Um, now, I mean, of course, kind of builds to a to a fist fight, but still, it's just a great scene in the way that it that it, that it builds all these things. Now, I could pick any of them, uh, really, I, I could, but. I, I have to pick that one just because it's so, so crazy, even for a Mission Impossible movie, for that to happen. All the ways, all the troubles that both of them get in in the helicopters and the just the the um, um, the state of the helicopters, the weather surrounding them. It's just or not the weather, but the, the climate surrounding them, you know, where they are. It, it's just it's just a great scene. It, it The way it builds and then and then pays itself off is just it's just magical. So I, I think I have to agree with you only because yeah. Cruz was actually committed and took six weeks of flight lessons. So he yeah. would fly a helicopter. <laughs> and the fact of that the, I, the IMAX company <laughs> trusted him with IMAX cameras because he almost hit a mountain in this movie. I was like. Those cameras, if they would have fallen off, or if you would have done something that's to where you mil- broke them, like millions of dollars. Yeah, that's expensive. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I, the guy is crazy. But you know what? <laughs> if they can keep making movies like this, um, even if McQuarrie doesn't come back to direct uh, next one, maybe he can be a writer, producer, whatever. Please continue on this path because I know Joel's going to disagree with me, but I'm going to say it: if you can be the sixth one in your franchise and still be good and you're getting better, kind of like the Fast and the Furious, then you're okay <laughs> in my book. Uh, I know Joel just rolled his eyes at that comment, but whatever. Whatever, son. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, my... It my got grade, better with the seventh one, I'll just say that. <laughs> well, you know, uh, my my final grade, I'm, I'm going to agree with Joel, it's an A-. Um, just just for the sheer fact that his team was sidelined, sidelined a, a little bit, and then that one character, it just... It was so random... Because they popped up just out of nowhere, and you're like, oh, like you were just as shocked as, um, you know, Ethan when uh, when he found them. I was like, yeah, why is that person here? Like it's just, I was just like, w- why? Um, and I get it, you want to wrap up story, but it's like they could have done a better job. Um, so yeah, I think as an action film. Uh, within the genre, it is definitely one of the better ones I've seen in a while. And to all the people, well, two comments. To the people that are saying this is just as good as Mad Max and this is like one of the best of all time, chill yourself. It's a really damn good movie, but, but let's calm down. Uh, yeah, second, the action, the action sequences might be on par. I don't think the movie's on par with Mad Max Fury Road. No, uh, it's, it's not. Yeah, there's there's a sense of efficiency just of plotting in Fury Road that I think you know that was a movie that just barely missed my top ten that year. It's a really good year, but. Um, but it was better than this because there was a sense of efficiency in the plotting. There were no, there was nothing like the forced introduction of or reintroduction of a character, like like there is here. And I think that that's a major plot gaffe. Uh, and I think that yeah, I think people need to chill out a little bit. You know, the the action scenes absolutely are on that par, but the movie is a different is a different thing because everything in a movie uh, generally matters in something like a comparison. Um, and when you get down to the brass tacks of it, it's it doesn't quite live up. And I don't even think it's the best movie in the series. It's a really great series, but I like the second one more. I like this. I like the third one more. Uh, and I think that this one's probably on the on the par with the last two. Um, and all of them are, are are just above the first one, which is still excellent. So it's a great series. But yeah, I, I think it's maybe even the third or fourth best. It's not. Yeah, I, I agree with. Um, do you, oh man, what's his name? It's. Uh... It's film critic uh, Brian. It, his last name starts with a T. Do you know who I'm talking about? Tallarico. Tallarico. So I, I I agree with that guy because I follow him on Twitter. He said he he compared Fallout perfectly, where on a technical level, it's perfect. It really yeah. is. Like on a technical level, it's lacking elsewhere. But as a on a technical front, and he compared it to Dunkirk. I totally agree. Mm. It is yeah. it is a flawless piece of technical work. Um. Even despite the issues. Now, the second last thing before I let Joel do his uh, surprise uh, s- review um, is definitely a surprise because I didn't think he'd pick it. Um, <laughs> I've told the people that are saying uh, Tom Cruise, just an action star. I-, I don't know what movies you're watching, but the guy has done <laughs> a lot of dramas, too, and he's done comedies yeah. like the guy is so well adverse in every genre 
that that makes him one of the best of all time, not because of his action stunts, but he's a great dramatic actor. He's really funny in Tropic Thunder. Look at his filmography. He has done some stuff, folks. So all the people and, out there that are just loving him for action stunts, watch more stuff, please. <laughs> and I think maybe his best performance uh, combines the two, and that's Minority Report. See, which yeah, Minority is, Report's great. Which is one heck of an action movie, one of the best action movies of the century so far. I think that that movie... People need to go back and watch it for the action scenes. If you want to just put it on mute, it's a great story. It's a great film, and it's a great screenplay. But just the action filmmaking in that, uh, it's it's Spielberg, so it's no surprise. But uh, it's it's on par with anything uh, in in this movie in terms of just the logistical filmmaking. And he and he mixes the two because it's a great dramatic role, and it's also using his. It's why he's perfect for that role. It's also using his talents as a movie star with a capital M and a, and a capital S in that, in that phrase, Tom Cruise movie star. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's great. So a minus for both of us, uh, let us know what you thought of it. Um, because for both of us, it's definitely a highlight this year. Um, and I will move on to my, uh, to my, uh, surprise review. And this is for surprise, surprise. <laughs> teen Titans go to the movies. Now, before okay. you, before you turn it off, guys, I had I had an enormous amount of fun with Mission Impossible Fallout. It's some of the most fun that I've had so far this year, and so is Teen Titans Go to the Movies. Um, okay, so this is a this is a feature length extension of the Teen Titans Go series. Now, the reason that I said extension and not adaptation is because this is this is basically the anti Powerpuff Girls movie. This is the anti My Little Pony the movie, where they just basically stretched an episode of the series out to its full length. In fact, I've heard from a lot of people who watch the show that this is infinitely better than anything in the show. Um, because what this movie does is it's incredibly self-reflexive. It's incredibly self-aware. It's incredibly self-referential and referential of other things, but not in a way that is kind of annoying. Like, I'm sorry about this, but kind of annoying, like the Deadpool movies. Um, in fact, (laughs) in fact, Deadpool the character is one of the reasons why I think this movie is so special. And it's because, and I'm going to just start off with this, the Teen Titans, the, the plot of the movie is basically that the Teen Titans feel that they need an arch nemesis. Um, and I'll get into the reason why they think though they think so, and specifically Robin, who's the leader of the group, thinks that they need an arch nemesis in a little bit. But the first thing that I'm going to say is that they finally find one in the in the form of Slade, um, who is also known as Deathstroke in the comics, and of course, Death uh, Deadpool was partly inspired by De- Deathstroke. Now, of course, they they took other elements of him, and uh, and all that, but he was partly inspired by him. Um, and so, there's a bit of a there's a three layer joke here. Um, they believe that that Deathstroke is Deadpool, and they keep bringing that up in the movie. Um, they, they keep calling him Deadpool, and he's so annoyed by it. But the but the funny part of the joke is not his annoyance, although that is pretty amusing. The funny part of the joke is that in the in the first scene when they meet him, um, Cyborg, uh, who's one, who's another one of the Teen, the teen Titans, voiced by Carrie Payton, um, has met him in his garb, you know, the mask and the big, you know solid armor and the swords and stuff and he's like deadpool and then he goes over and he happily puts his arm around deathstroke and he looks at the camera while talking to deathstroke and says quick say something look at the camera and say something inappropriate and it's this three-layered joke because one cyborg is actually breaking for the fourth wall in this moment and he's also telling a joke about a character who breaks the fourth wall and it's just this this three layer joke, and and of course you know the first layer is that they think it's Deadpool, which is funny enough, and then they they tell him to act like Deadpool while breaking the fourth wall, which is the second layer, and then the third layer is that well of course because Deathstroke is always is always kind of confused for Deadpool in this in this uh, particular kind of I mean it's different it's uh, rival universes, but they're they're kind of confused for each other. So there's it, you get the sense in the screenplay, which um, is written by the, the TV series creator, Michael Jelenic, and also the co-director of the movie, um, Adam Horvath. Um, you get the sense in the screenplay that we're well beyond just simple 
you know, funny references. We're getting into genuinely self-reflexive um, uh, subversiveness of the superhero genre when you do this. And if that, and if it isn't proven, I'll, I'll get there. It's, it, it gets even more crazy. So the plot of the movie is very simple, but basically they feel that they need an arch nemesis because Robin is fed up with the fact that there are so many superhero movies coming out and none of them are about him. Uh, so they go to a premiere for the for a movie called, and I kid you not, it's called Batman Again, um, where Batman is mostly silent, but he, Jimmy Kimmel's credited for his voice. I'm not sure where he voices him, but he's mostly silent in this movie, um, and he's he's you know had his movie premiere, and um, and and Robin is super annoyed when he sees a big presentation from a, a big shot producer voiced by Kristen Bell. Uh, that there's a bunch of uh, superhero movies and three of them are movies about Batman's car, Batman's butler Alfred and Batman's utility belt. And he's just annoyed because he feels like he's his, he's Batman's best, you know, best tool uh, almost. He's, he's just as important and, and, um, should get his own movie. And so, you know, he, he and the other Titans feel like they need to, they need to leverage this in some way. So they go, they they um uh they confront the producer and she's like well you know no I, I, you know you're just not really important I, you're the last one I would think of so <laughs> all right so this is where it gets insane this movie is one gigantic big like <laughs> I keep laughing because it's so funny so the first thing that they realize they need to do is that they need to go back in time and they need to prevent all of the other superheroes from becoming superheroes. Now, I'm not going to give away everything that happens, but I will just give away one because they have to reverse this process. So in one of the things, they have to go back and redirect Bruce Wayne's parents down a different alleyway uh, on that fateful night when when they're killed. Now, I'm not going to give away the punchline, but when they when they reverse all of the superheroics and make every other superhero uh, irrelevant, it becomes disastrous. And they have to reverse that process. And if you don't think that this movie has the courage of its convictions, let's just say there's a twisted punchline there. And it just is so creative because you get this feeling that they're not just giving us this reheated version of the series. They're genuinely making a satire about how there are too many superhero movies out right now. And that's sort of reflected in the in the villain's main plot, which is to and I and I kid you not that, that this that this was probably like conceived before this became a potential thing. There's literally the the villain's plot is to create a streaming service that will that will hypnotize people and make them always watch superhero movies all the time. That's that's the, that is the villain's plot in this movie, and it's. And it's such a funny thing. And so, you know, there are other things. There are the little things, like um, just little glimpses. Like, a, uh, <laughs> and I hate giving this away because it's a great, it's a great scene. But even giving it away doesn't doesn't take away from that. Stan Lee has a has a cameo in this movie that is the cameo to end all cameos. And it's just, it's so great. Uh, there's a little glimpse of one of the movies that the producers is, that the producer is making, and it's Batman v Superman two. And we get a and we get a glimpse of uh, <laughs> uh, Batman and Superman bringing up to each other that their name that their mother's name is uh, Martha, and then <laughs> they bring up another family member and they continue the fight. So like there, you know, there's that. There's so many of these jokes, so many different levels of of reference points, and um, just such creativity in the plotting. Even when you know they inevitably come up against a villain in the end, and there's this doomsday device, the stakes are completely different. Um, the doomsday device isn't the usual thing, and I'm, I'm, I mean I'm I'm really trying hard not to like ruin all of the surprises, but there's so many of them that that th this movie's so packed full of them that that it's impossible to do that. And I just I just had a blast with this. Um, you know there are problems. It gives a little too much time to like poop jokes and fart jokes. There are those here, uh, but it's just really those those kind of go too far. But they are uh, 
the the sticking point is that they're a juxtaposition to all of the cl- other clever stuff. So they stick out like a sore thumb, but they're really also not super important. Um, it, there's there's a little too much time spent on the fact that at one point, all of all but one of the Titans use a prop toilet to uh, do something. Um, uh, all of them, and it's a toilet that doesn't work. And so there's, you know. Th- all right. Well, you you know what. I'm I'm really hoping to do this again. Uh, I'm gonna be really angry. Um. All right. So Noah's back on. All right. So sorry about that. Uh, if you, there was a a uh, a glitch, I'm calling Joel right now. Hey Joel. Uh. So uh. You uh, lost connection. You went to the upside down and you came back. Uh. How was season three? And uh, second, <laughs> second question is, I was really worried that uh, you might have a heart attack again. Um. Be, because uh the episode was almost uh lost in connectivity with the internet. And so I would have asked you like would you want to redo this all again? You'd be like hell no and then we'd have to go cry. Um so anyways, let's wrap this up before uh we have another uh another thing like that. <laughs> yeah, uh basically I don't know when I cut out. When did I cut out? Uh, you did... were cutting out um you were talking about the Titans using toilets as props. Oh, okay. Well, in any case, that's that's one of the um that's one of the like the the worst parts of the movie, but it's so clever. And and I also didn't mention Will Arnett voices the villain, and so you know that's a little clever joke because he played Batman in the Lego Batman movie and 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 all of that and in that universe. And so um, you know obviously they just came to him and said you know Batman's in our movie, but we don't want you to voice him. We want you to voice this other character. And it's it's just it's clever. So there's just layers upon layers of cleverness here, and I think that. The movie um, really exceeds expectations in in all of that. It's just it's just so clever, and it finally goes for the heartstrings too in a in a in a way that it then immediately undercuts. Um, but it also uh, you know carries across that message. So it's just a it's just a really fun movie, uh, and I'm giving Teen Titans Go to the movies a B plus. That um, is quite yeah. shocking. And if you if you thought. You were gonna hear bad things coming out of this man's mouth. You were uh, proven wrong. So if if you took a bet uh, this weekend on what Joel would you think <laughs> you lost money, <laughs> you lost money. Uh, you might have to repurpose your house, uh, remortgage, do what you gotta do. All right. So um, that is a fascinating review. And uh, now we're gonna get to the numbers that are gonna back up or maybe not back up what we claim. Uh, were these movies as popular as we say they were? Joel, for the box office results, your only two hints are Teen Titans Go to the movies and Mission <laughs> Impossible Fallout. Okay. Oh, boy. Um, let me see. Last week was Equalizer and Mamma Mia for Skyscraper, which is kind of dropped. Ugh. I'm going to say number five is maybe hmm. – I'm going to say number five is maybe Mamma Mia. Number four, Equalizer 2. Number three – well, maybe maybe number four is Ant-Man. So hanging in there. Number three is – oh, no, wait. I'm sorry. Number four would be oh, – man, I, I can't figure this out. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to go with it. Number five. Mamma Mia, number four, Incredibles two. There we go. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't forget it this time. Um, number three, Teen Titans. No, that doesn't seem right. Hmm. This is this is tricky. Uh, number four. Okay, number five. I'm not gonna say Mamma Mia. I'm gonna. Well, man, Mamma Mia, number two though. Would it have dropped that much? Don't you like hearing me trying to figure this out, folks? Um. <laughs> and he's gonna he's gonna rain man it, and he's gonna like actually get all five of them correct. Watch this. He's gonna, right? he's gonna work it out in his head. Watch it. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Number five, Ant Man and the Wasp. Number four, Mamma Mia. Number three, Teen Titans. Number two, Equalizer 2, and number one, Mission Impossible Fallout. So I have two things for you. One, one. <laughs> you got one out of five correct. <laughs> and the second thing is 
This is two weeks in a row because I forgot it last week. Joel forgot Hotel Transylvania 3. Oh, yeah. So that's the second <laughs> time in a row that we forgot about that movie. So there you go, Sony. That's how much we, we love your franchise. All right. So, all right. Ant-Man and the Wasp and Incredibles 2 are not in the top five. Oh, okay. Uh, Teen Titans Go to the Movies is number five. It actually wow. compared. Well, actually, well, let me explain. For an anime movie, not good. For its budget, it's wonderful. So it made $10 million, which is kind of bad, but its budget's only $10 million. So, you know, double that with marketing. It's going to do so well in streaming that I, I don't even it, – it's going to be fine. Um, but t- j- that's just really funny because when I saw those numbers, I was like, ooh, that was that's really bad. Would they spend like $60 million on that? They only spent $10 million on it, so they're, they'll do fine. Uh, so yeah. that's number five. Number four – is Hotel Transylvania 3, Summer Vacation with $12 million. And as of right now, on its $80 million budget, we have 119 domestic and 284 worldwide. C- congratulations, it made money. Um, so th- the jokes can stop. It's, uh, it's now a profitable movie. But then again, this is the same company that did uh, the Emoji movie, so whatever. Uh, number three <laughs> is Equalizer 2 with $14 million, uh, doing pretty well for a very, for a very bland movie. We have a uh, budget sixty two million worldwide. It's at seventy. Still got a long way to go, but Denzel's the king, and he he's gonna get a lot of money in theaters, and he's gonna get a lot of money through rentals. So there's the power of Denzel. Number two is Mamma Mia two. Uh, here we go again. Hi hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, with fifteen million, and then <laughs> its budget is seventy five million. Uh, on a worldwide total of one sixty seven. So. It's about to break even. Um, probably when it hits that two hundred million mark, uh, it'll be in the clear. But you know, whatever. And the highest grossing one in the franchise, number one, Mission Impossible Fallout. Joel, would you like to take a stab at the amount? Ooh, uh, something like fifty to sixty million. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not solid on this stuff. But. So it made sixty one point five. Ooh, is, okay, good. Yeah, it's um, yeah. the first one to break into the 60s. The last yeah, yeah, because that's why I guess 50 to 60, because they've all been kind of in there, Yeah, in so that range. <laughs> yeah. Rogue Nation, I think, debuted with about 56. Um, so yeah. this one, great. <laughs> it went up. Uh, that's what you're supposed to do in sequels. Uh, it's budget, uh, because, listen, if you're going to do real stunts, it's going to cost some stuff. Um, it's $178 million, uh, but worldwide, get this. This is why Tom Cruise is literally the white Denzel. Worldwide on its first weekend, 153. That's great. And so uh, when you have your budget at 178, I'm going to round it up to 180 because that's math is easier that way. Then you double that to 360. Marketing, I'm going to say, because there's a lot of marketing push, this is a very, uh, very out there number, but I'm going to say anywhere from 450 to 500 to break even. This is one of those franchises that continues to make money no matter what. So. I really don't have any, like, you know, worries for it. I think it'll do fine. Um, okay, so all the other ancillary stuff. <laughs> Unfriended Dark Web gained one theater <laughs> this past <laughs> week. It, it literally just says plus one. It's amazing. Um, nice. Blind Spotting, which is will be a great segue into what we're about to discuss to you for next week. It gained 294% business, and it gained 509 theaters. That's amazing. On top of that, eighth grade went up almost sixty percent in business and gained one hundred and twenty five theaters. Ooh. On top of that, three identical strangers went down in business thirteen percent, but it gained one hundred and one theaters. Awesome. Um, and that's about it in terms of you know big drops or whatever. Uh, don't really. Uh, don't worry. He will. He won't get far on foot. The Amazon film with Jonah Hill and Joaquin Phoenix uh, gained thirty-one percent business and it gained two hundred theaters. So make that what you will. Um, that's about it. I mean, it's just you know pretty basic numbers. Um, it, I, I think what's really a great thing to take away from this is that in twelfth place is sorry to bother you. 13th place is blind spotting. 14th place is 8th grade. 15th place is three identical strangers. And 16th place is won't you be my neighbor. 
they're all within the top 20 and they're all low budget indie films and documentaries. That's yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's pretty news. awesome. And then leave no traces number 20. Yeah. So it's which, like, um, it's awesome. It's great news. Yeah. Um, and, uh, this is also really great. Cause usually documentaries don't make this much. Won't you be my neighbor has a domestic total of 20 million. That's unheard yeah, that's of awesome. for that genre. So that's, yeah. that's great news. This has just been a, a great week all around. I have no, um, no worries, no anxieties. Like, this weekend was pretty solid for the business. And speaking of blind spotting, Joel, take it away. Yeah, so next week, uh, in fact, uh, I guess we'll just go over the next month. Yeah, let's, <laughs> we, go, ahead, we just, let's go ahead and tease August. Yeah, let's let's tease August. Uh, so the next two weeks uh, are actually going to be sort of the racial drama uh, things. I don't know if one of them is solidly a drama, but the racial movies. Uh, there's Blind Spotting is going to be our main review next week, uh, and then Black Klansman is going to be the, name, the main review the following week. That's pretty cool. Uh, both I'm looking forward to. Um, and then uh, the following week after Black Klansman, uh, the main review is going to be Mile 22. Uh, the week after that is going to be uh, one of Chase's most anticipated movies, The Happy Time Murders, which, oh boy, uh, <laughs> I can't wait for that. Um, and then, and then of course, the uh, first weekend of September is going to be our fall preview. So, uh, that one's, you know, obviously we're going to try to get Graham back for that. Um, you know, so that's going to be pretty awesome. And, uh, yeah, so that's our, that's our month of August ahead. Yeah. It's, uh, an exciting month. Indeed. We have two sticks films, uh, distributed movies and we have two, uh, like Joel said, kind of, uh, really focusing on, you know, racial discrimination and, um, being a unique voice in today's time. So a very fascinating group of movies indeed. One involves puppet sex and one involves probably some really important stuff uh, with race, (laughs) racial discrimination. So, yeah, there we go. We we live in this world. So um, very exciting month ahead, but next week will be blind spotting. And, uh, Joel, where can the lovely people find you online? Uh, You can find much of my writing at joelonfilm.com. I've got a bunch of reviews up there. Uh, This weekend's theatrical releases are all top ten contenders, eighth grade, Mission Impossible, Fallout, and Teen Titans Go. Um, And then I, you know, caught up at home with uh, Disobedience. It's really quiet, good drama with uh, the Rachels, uh, Weiss and McAdams. It's good. Uh, Rachel McAdams is amazing. It's one of the best performances of the year, so definitely catch up with that, folks. Uh, and I also caught up with a couple of, eh, whatever, uh, I Feel Pretty, which I thought was blah, and then Traffic, which is pretty bad. That's a Paula Patton thing that didn't screen for critics in April. Um, so I, I caught up with those at home, so you can find those reviews there. And then I also did, um, I also have Twitter, you know, at Real Joel Copling, also on Letterboxd at Jay Copling, uh, that's how you can search me. And then, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I've got a, I, I should have a review soon-ish on Dallas Movie Screenings, finally. Uh, pretty soon, but it's been kind of a wasteland. But you can you can find you can find some of my writing there. All my reviews from the film festival in May are there. Uh, I haven't reviewed anything since then, but um, but yeah. So there there I am online. Yeah, and speaking of Dallas movie screenings, uh, you know we represent that website, and this is the official podcast of that website. And speaking of that, you know I did a couple reviews for them, uh, Hot Summer Nights, and uh, finally. Uh, eighth grade came to Dallas and we saw that almost two years ago. So we finally get to post up a review of that and uh, other reviews that you might guys might find are on my YouTube channel, including the one where I'm excited to debut tomorrow morning and get more death threats than I ever have uh, before. Um, so that will be fun. So yeah, check out all those reviews there. And of course for this podcast, whether you're listening on iTunes, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spreaker, CastBox, wherever you're listening, please spread this around. Let people know this is the definitive movie podcast and of course my twitter is at real chase lee, chase lee but all of those links will be in the description below that's joel i'm chase and hey listen if you made it through this entire movie podcast and you're not a movie fan hopefully we convince you to be one you guys are awesome stay awesome see you next week for episode 241 of real man colon a movie podcast Bye-bye. bye bye